Welcome to Windows on the World. This is 8 p.m. UK time on a Wednesday. It's our new time slot. We actually do a show at 9 p.m. every Sunday. And that's a radio show, but we've started to do live streams. I actually did a live stream last night with Jason Leosartos on his Outside the Box channel. We had a great talk and we touched upon a few of the things I'm going to touch upon this evening with my guest, Lark, from Texas. And we're going to be talking about the bigger picture the way society has been re-engineered and what that's really about. We're going to be talking about a word called communitarianism. Now, I actually associate this with the rebuilding of society, societies being re-engineered. And what's interesting about this is that it actually impacts on every aspect of our lives. I talk about the United Nations Agenda 2030, which came out of United Nations Agenda 21 in the, in the uh, 90s. and we talk about how this is implemented. We're talking about policies that are implemented above government, above national government. And that's where it starts to get very interesting and dots start to be joined. So I'm going to be joined with uh, Lark by Lark in Texas. And we're going to talk about communitarianism, the way it's rolled out, what it is, who enforces it and how, and how you can recognize it in your own community because what communitarianism is all about is the rights of a group over individuals and I've been on the receiving end of this over the last three years with a small charity that was taken over and it's one of the things that happens is that courts rule against individuals in favor of self-defined community now this self-defined community can be a bunch of cuckoos who come in and take over a building and they can actually imitate the the people who are there. They can become them. And I've seen this happen. So this is pretty scary stuff. But this really is what communitarianism is all about. It's the rights of a group over the individual. And that group is what we call a hive mind. People are mentored into this new form and system of governance, which we're going to be talking about tonight. We've covered it in a lot of our shows. So I'm going to welcome now Lark in Texas. Can you hear us, Lark? I can indeed. How are you, Mark? Very well. We've had a few conversations over Skype, and we were introduced uh, by, I think, Bryzer uh, at uh, the radio station I was on about a year ago. And it took me a while to get in touch with you, and I'm really glad I did, because we've been sharing information, and I've got a lot to learn from your research. So can you just introduce yourself and give us a bit of your background and how you got involved in this looking at communitarianism? Well, I'm just a regular guy. I'm 65 years old. I live in uh, Richardson, Texas, which is uh, uh, just north of Dallas. And uh, I don't know, I was a late adopter to this technology. I didn't get online until 2004. At the time, I was operating a business. I had a dozen employees. I was one of these bricks and mortars types of businesses that didn't want to adapt. Uh, eventually was forced to adapt and when I did and with what I learned uh, in 2004, very shortly I discovered this word communitarian in the end of uh, Nikki Rapana at her blog, Living Outside the Dialectic, do a search. And uh, essentially read everything I could get my hands on about this topic and of course was uh, quite concerned that nobody seemed to be talking about it. And uh, so I've been uh, solely devoted to researching this topic for the last 15 years and I've been active on the internet for 10 years. When I uh, decided that, uh, or when I learned that you could call in to talk radio broadcasts and do all these other kind of things, I've been cognizant of the fact that everything you say and do on the internet is tracked and it stays there. It can always be accessed. And so I, I'm a little troubled by this technology, but I'm cognizant of the fact that, you know, we really have needed it to connect dots because, you know, most of us realize today uh, that we've been lied to all of our lives or we were provided the idiot's treatment about things like history and the law, the nature of contracts and everything else. And uh, so I'm happy for the technology, of course, because I've had many questions left unanswered throughout my life. But uh, 
So anyway, I regard communitarianism as the elephant in the room that nobody sees. And all of us know mm -hmm. the fable of the blind men and the elephant. The Hindu sojourners who are blind who happen upon an elephant. One man touches the side of the elephant and proclaims that he's bumped into a wall. Another man touches upon the elephant's tusk and exclaims, but it is like a spear. Another one has touched upon the elephant's tail and he says, well, no, it's a rope. And another one touches the elephant's trunk and it's, oh, it's a snake. So this is what communitarianism is. It's an eight syllable word that you're never gonna hear on your Sunday talk shows. You know, your, uh, your leading lights in the fourth estate, big media pathways, they're never gonna say this word because you know, it's a little complicated and uh, it's difficult to spell, it's hard to say. And uh, they like it quite, uh, they like it like that. It's just that simple. Now this concept goes back, sorry, sorry, like this concept goes back quite a long way. I was just gonna try and prompt you to give us the, the history of where the word actually came from, because I think that's quite important. Well, yes, it was, uh, it was coined from the French into the English in 1841 by one John Goodwin Barmby. B-A-R-M as in Mary, B as in boy, Y. And uh, I like to say that it's uh, it's important to understand the uh, the flavor of the times in 1841. 1841 was the year that Clinton Roosevelt uh, published a book called The Science of Government Founded on Natural Law. Pierre Joseph Proudhon in France published a pamphlet entitled, What is Property?, question mark, in which he suggested that property ownership was tantamount to theft. Charles Mackey published a book in 1841 called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. But John Goodwin Barnby was also the Englishman who introduced the French word communisme into English, and that became known as communism. So this man, Barnby, was a contemporary of both Marx and Engels. And then we all understand and know that in 1848 was the publication of the Communist Manifesto and the breakout of revolutions in Europe. You can look that up, revolutions of 1848. So there is where this work comes from. But of course, it goes all the way back into antiquity and uh, the mystery schools and uh, the concept has been with us really forever. Today though, communitarianism is a rebranding. Like, yes. Communitarianism today is a rebranding of the isms known as capitalism and communism. Was that succinct enough there for yeah, you, Mark? I think, well, very good, very good. I, I think there might be a little bit dela of delay sometimes, so I'll I'll leave a gap when I finish before you come in again. So, so if we can both leave a little gap, then we won't overlap. So yes, I've come across this really in a big way since 2010. The David Cameron government actually announced that they were going to be using communitarianism. And from this, we got a thing over here called the Big Society. Of course, Obama did the same thing in America with Obama's army, these community organizers. We had community organizers here. Websites started to crop up with titles like community organizers. Um, we had unlimited locality, intentionality. These are all ways of making it look as though it's going local. So in other words, you are being infiltrated. What happens is, which I've noticed, is that for instance, the borough that I was living in, Waltham Forest in northeast London, I noticed that people were appearing with these communitarian agendas. What do I mean by communitarian agendas? Well, I mean that they were taking over the narrative of public opinion everywhere. And they were broadly mentored into the new rules, which are that climate change, anthropogenic climate change is a threat because that has to be the enemy. And this is where communitarianism joined in with that and basically we have this new system so 
in a way, we can look at uh, organizations like Extinction Rebellion, that's basically communitarianism, because what it means is that a huge group of people who act like a hive mind then take the rights off all other individuals. And that's why I saw it happening. People who were coming in who were very, very well trained, but they had very limited ideology. In other words, they couldn't really argue, so they were intolerant to things outside of their own created so-called paradigm. Is this what you're talking about, Lot? Absolutely. And of course, it can be rephrased in a hundred different other ways, just as well as you just did, as, as we understand. But it is, a, I, I considered it a meme virus, and I consider that we're involved in a mimetic warfare. We're dealing with parasitism, and we're, pe we're dealing with people who have jumped on the bandwagon of the uh, communitarian gestalt. And the reason is, is because they are, they are, they want to be successful, and uh, they want to go along with whatever is going to allow them to be successful. And these people are essentially bought and paid for. You know, you and I today, Mark, are behind enemy lines. We're surrounded by zombies and criminals, just like every listener to this podcast today. And we need to come to grips with this. What we're dealing with is unwitting dupes and useful idiots. We're talking about people that have experienced uh, trauma-based mind control from in the universities. And it's these so-called professionals, the best and brightest amongst us, the ones who are the most success-driven, who are leading the charge. These people are very often the most brainwashed of all members of our society. And uh, we have to remember the remarks of people like John Maynard Keynes. You can go to a website, do a search, Keynes at Harvard. He said, famously or infamously, however you wish to look at it, he said that the Marxian socialist had it all wrong. Yet the Fabian socialist had it all right. What he said was that Marx wanted to go after the proletariat, the, the man wielding the pitchfork, so that they could storm the Bastille and change the order of the day etc. However, the Fabian socialist adopted a strategy of gradualism and or incrementalism. They knew that the people that they would target first and foremost were the best and brightest amongst us, the beautiful, the smart, the talented, the success driven, the careerist, the credentialist, the opportunist, trust fund babies, anybody that could be looked upon as a thought leader in our world today are the people they targeted. And that's why they've been successful. This is so true, yeah. This is so true. What I've noticed is that we have all these organizations like Unlimited, Locality, Intentionality, Citizens UK, they all sprang up and they're all about training future leaders. We have crown agents in hundreds of countries all over the world. I think we're in a hundred countries, maybe more. And they, they train future leaders in other countries. This is a virus that goes everywhere. I've seen it in foreign countries. It's, it's rolled out through NGOs. And all of this came out of a document as well called Our Common Future. They were pushing the communitarian agenda because they knew that with belief in man-made climate change, they had the religion. And all they had to do was use the principles of communitarianism to basically infiltrate every single organization. Is this what you're talking about, Lark? Well, yes. The people who are more most facile in their use of the language, in other words, they've taken to the brainwashing in such a way that they can wield the language to uh, convince and or influence, persuade others to follow along and join that same bandwagon. Those are the people that are elevated into the ranks of our uh, media personalities, our politicos, you know, people in think tanks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, even university professors, uh, school superintendents, uh, pastors, rabbis, priests, and the like. These are the people that are elevated because they're the they have become the best adapted to the language of communitarian code speak, which is rather much like Orwellian newspeak or double thing. But yes, these people are, soci are uh, essentially uh, budding sociopaths and uh, crooks. 
That's what they are. Every one of them. Yes. And what we're talking about here is citizens groups, citizens groups being formed in your area. So, in other words, your citizens assembly, this is all about communitarianism. That's exactly what it is. It doesn't mean everyone agrees. It means that everyone appears to agree. And then what do we get? Consensus, the C word. Yes, consensus comes out of this need for change. What's the change? They never tell you what the change is. When you mention think tanks and government organizations there, it really struck home with me because we have a government think tank in the UK called Demos. You have one in the in the States and it actually does very similar things. It works along this communitarianism hive mind agenda. But Demos actually stated that the new democracy in the UK would work with a combination of government open infiltration and citizens groups taking direct action. Of course, Extinction Rebellion of the citizens group taking direct action. So what happens is you get the globalists who create their anti-globalist movement. So they control everything. They control the whole narrative. So if you want the public to agree to something, make room for protest, make it look as though they can protest against what you're going to impose but they actually protest about what the government actually wants so in other words the government wants to carbon tax and control under the un the the, the national government is not important anymore and the reason for that is the national government in the uk has given power to a george soros funded organization to implement what's called citizens assemblies which use the communitarian rules of consensus and basically steering people into a predicted outcome by a process called delphi technique which is done through facilitators and this is where the whole communitarian communitarian agenda comes together are you aware of the delphi technique Yes, I'm also aware that it came from the Rand Corporation, which ha happened to be incorporated right. or had to happen to have been incorporated on the very day that the state of Israel declared its independence. It's very similar to a situation known as uh, Facebook today. Facebook was born from a military project called LifeLog. And as soon as uh, the funding was withdrawn for LifeLog, uh, Facebook was incorporated and so we need to we need to make some connections of the dots in these arenas too but uh, I, I've seen it, it you, there's many ways to describe uh, what has happened historically that has brought us to this point in time but uh, there's no question about it we're dealing with uh, really uh, you know I, I I look at it this way the communitarians Remember this, a communitarian can be a communitarian and not even know of the word. Okay? They don't necessarily even know that they're communitarians. They, again, probably have never yes, heard the word. Yes, that's very true. Very true. And so yes. the overarching agenda, this overarching agenda, uh, communitarian agenda is really twofold. The first is depopulation. And depopulation is really just a stand standalone word, a euphemism, if you will, for various types of warfare which are being waged against you and me and everybody else. Now, this is total war, but it's a silent war very often. It's not about guns blazing and bombs going off necessarily. What it is is psychological, asymmetrical, mimetic, cultural, economic, spiritual, <clears throat> cybernetic. These types of war, lawfare, is a type of war that's being waged against us. And the second aspect after depopulation is, and remember, this is their aims, their intention, is one of techno-slavery. This is technological slavery. They want, first of all, to control the narrative. They want to control all media pathways. Uh, they want to control your mind. And they want to control the thoughts that emanate from your mind because, again, they're waging a mimetic war upon us. And uh, so when we think about technology, we have to consider that language itself is man's oldest technology. Then we have to look at this thing called money, which is another form of technology or a tool, a contrivance of man that is used to control us. And then finally, we have 
our love affair with machines and technologies and tools uh, going back to our time in caves uh, when we were hunter-gatherers. You know, the rock, the stick, the fulcrum, the lever, the anvil, the axe. These are all technologies or tools. Then we have the industrial age now being supplanted by the so-called information age. And now look at the tools and the machines and the toys that we love so much. And that would be things like smart devices and computers and laptops and smart meters and cell phone towers and 5G and all this madness. The techno crazies have literally taken hold of our culture. You can even read on the internet something that's actually penned by two communitarians. You might remember James Burke in the UK. He's a popular TV personality. The BBC series, BBC series was called mm -hmm. Connections. And he, he uh, authored a report called A Report on the Axe Maker's Gifts. Technologies Capture and Control of Our Minds and Culture. So there we have it. The overarching agenda is depopulation, the war on you. And yes, it does include biological warfare, ladies and gentlemen. And yes, what is their aim? Is to make you a damn slave. It's a control and management system of all people, property, assets, and everything on the planet. We've gone into that quite a lot. And this is what we talk about in our bigger picture talks, which we've actually renamed the real citizens assembly because we are the real citizens assembly because the citizens assemblies being rolled out in the uk have nothing to do with democracy and i think people might be getting a little bit of an inkling as to why these citizens assemblies are being rolled out obviously they want to get the public to accept more and more draconian taxation and lose their rights how do you do that you make them feel good about it you give them a religion we've got the gaia religion the new age religion basically we've got people who are mentored into the program now so they're mentored into the program and they believe that they need to depopulate themselves so this is the end result of communitarianism we've got um, extinction rebellion who are a globalist anti-globalist organization they're a globalist funded anti-globalist organization so in other words unpopular policies can be implemented by the people this is what this communitarian agenda is about it's not only about the people it's about a kind of super agency basically globalism world government so I think that's a great introduction lot you've covered a lot of ground there I'd like to take it down to the local level now of how we see it because when we go from global to local that's really what communitarianism is all about and it was actually Marshall McLuhan who coined the term global village and the media is the message so he obviously knew where things were going and a lot of this is very clever social engineering it's clever social engineering but the actual implementation of it is simple it has to be simple otherwise it wouldn't work so we have a template now of all these different organizations ngos are basically a shadow government running many countries i've seen it in other countries and it's certainly true in the uk what we have are thousands and thousands of ngos and we have people who are mentored into this new program this new program of communitarianism and it's done through organizations yes i've mentioned some locality intentionality unlimited unlimited have agents in every country in the world as do crown agents these are just two there are lots and lots of these and they mentor people into this broad idea uh, which has a very narrow kind of way of implementing itself and it will implement itself in your local area you will get things like sewing groups starting up community hubs not community centers because they've all been closed down we now have community hubs a community hub will appear and the next thing is all your roads will start to close we had this in Waltham Forest they tell you what you're going to get and then they bring in the people to implement it it's very simple it's like infiltration and of course we have to look at the whole bigger picture what are antifa antifa are a militant form of communitarianism you have to have something for everybody it's the system of moods this is a thing the soviets were really clever at so you give people a bit of what they want you let people think that they're part of an anarchist group you let people think that they're protesting against the government. You let people think that they're in a new age movement. You let people think all of these different moods and get them involved in their own little groups. But their own little groups are part of the whole. 
that's what communitarianism is. It contains everything. It's a container, a holdall container for all moods and everything that affects the livelihood of people into a new form of totalitarianism. And totalitarianism recognizes no limits to authority and strives to regulate every aspect of public and private life. Now, what the difference is meant to be with communitarianism is it emphasizes the, the group over the individual. But the group is a hive mind, so there is no individuality. Do you want to pick up on that, Lark? Well, communitarians also believe that nobody has rights uh, unless they're accompanied by duties and responsibilities. When we talk about balancing and harmonizing of norms, the rights of the individual as opposed to the rights of the community at large, we can look. We can liken this as the camel's nose under the tent. And uh, everything is uh, tilted towards the rights of the community and against the rights of the individual. And, um, you know, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said this. He said, the first step of the courageous individual is not to take part in the lie. One word of truth outweighs the world. Now, I have actually substituted that word lie for the letters and the word W E we and I liken it to the novel written in the 20s written by Evgeny Zamyatin entitled we and if anybody wants to look that up in their encyclopedias Zamyatin is uh, Z A M Y A T I N the novel is called we it's in every encyclopedia you can read about what a smart city of today and into the future is going to be like unless we can stop this train wreck from happening. That's what's happening. And uh, I I have likened communitarianism to parasitism, neocolonialism, uh, neo-feudalism, neo-platonism, but it's also a system of arrested development in which your human potential is deliberately harvested and or thwarted your pathways in life are narrowed your freedoms of choice and options in life are narrowed things like exercise of free will is to be done away with personal autonomy the whole idea of independent thought and action is done away with in favor of dependency codependency and interdependency it's a gigantic scam and most of the people that are affecting and are implementing the vision, they are at once the, uh, uh, I mean, these people are criminals. They are unwitting dupes and useful idiots. They have no idea what it is that they're doing. And they don't really give a damn, most of them, if you told them and you, and you spelled it out in black and white. So... Uh, uh, again, yeah, that's absolutely true, Lark. I want to give some examples of that. Yeah. Some examples? I want to give some examples of that now because you're absolutely right. Yeah. Please do. I'm going to give some examples now. We did a, a series of talks. We go around the country, we do a series of talks. We broadly call a bigger picture, but it's been renamed the Real Citizens Assembly. And we talk about how this is imposed in your local community, what it's about, how it ties into the climate change agenda, the climate change policy agenda. And we did a talk recently in Fairbourne in North Wales. Fairbourne was a little village, still is a little village, that's going to be decommissioned in the next 30 to 40 years. It's being used as an example of rising sea levels where they are not going to be able to pay for the sea defences and we got the world's leading expert in sea levels, Niels Axel Morner, to go to court on their behalf and say the sea levels will never rise to these predicted intergovernmental panel on climate change predictions and I'll go to court for you said Niels Axel Morner, the world's leading expert in sea levels and also an intergovernmental panel on climate change panelist and he was a contributor to three of their AR reports. Just look that up. Basically, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put out these reports every couple of years. There's the AR4, AR5, and AR6. And they're all about really mitigation. They're about what we should do to mitigate against climate change. Well, of course, we can't mitigate against climate change. 
we can mitigate against extreme weather to a certain degree, but certainly not climate change. The climate's changing all the time. So we went down to the village. We had a local councillor on our side straight away. And I arrived and what struck me was what had, had gone on in the local press. I got onto a local newspaper called the Cambrian Times and I gave them the information. And the information was that we had the world's leading expert in sea levels and he was prepared to actually go to court for them. Let me just pull this article. This is quite interesting because I'll tell you what I actually said to the press and th this will start to tie into what we're talking about. So I sent in world leading sea level expert and IPCC panelist offers to support Fairborn in court over decommissioning. I gave him all the links and I said, I'm glad that you're a family newspaper because some of these big online newspapers do tend to slander people. Well, that was very interesting. What happened was, I get this back. This is what was printed into the local paper. Protest planned against talk giving false hope. Now, this is exactly what you're talking about, Lark. The narrative was controlled by just a few people. It says, a protest will take place in Fairbourne against a talk which a local campaigner claims will give residents false hope. It doesn't say who the local campaigner is or whether he's got any qualification to say this whatsoever. Windows on the World will hold a talk at Free Up and Fairbourne Village Hall this Saturday, 25th of January, advising the public that Fairbourne is being threatened with extinction through fear-mongering. Now, I never said that. I never said anything about fear-mongering, so that's a complete misquote. The talk has angered some people. Well, this is interesting, because what they were trying to do is say that they were controlling the narrative and that people were angered. In fact, they weren't. Um, it said, a protest has been organised from 11.45 a.m. Quentin Deakin alerted the Cambrian News to the strength of feeling against the talk. Now, this is interesting, because... Um, we're talking about the idea of climate change is a religion and if you go against the idea that there's an apocalypse then you're in big trouble because we were bringing some science to the table and it didn't like that so what he said was that basically uh, the protest is not being organized by any one group or one individual he said which was told, said that basically he'd organized it um, about this strength of feeling. It says, Extinction Rebellion groups, Green and Tawin and the Labour Party have been contacted and it is likely that there will be some from each of these groups and perhaps who don't belong to any of the above. It will be peaceful. Mr Deacon has criticised the material offered on the Windows on the World page online saying the information about climate change is propaganda. Well, this is a nice reversal, isn't it? So it is important to have a protest People going away from this event may think Windows of the World is widely supported. He said, well, how does he know it isn't? Meanwhile, campaigner Graham Hogg said the talk offered the worst kind of hope to a community that is suffering. Now, this person, Graham Hogg, is in trouble now. He's actually preemptively blocked me on Twitter because I asked him if he wrote an article which came out in a newsletter. They also put a newsletter out against us, right? And um, he says... The records mm. taken at Barmouth show a constant year-on-year -year rise. Well, we'd have to look at that and look at the satellite altimetry data to actually confirm that. It said, sadly, Mark Windows' conspiracy theories on sea levels not rising are as reliable as rumours that alien remains can be found at Roswell and Elvis is still alive. Now, this is not even a very good kind of um, logical fallacy because... Uh, it is alleged that alien remains were found at Roswell and taken away by the military. And Elvis may still be alive. There's, there's no proof that he's dead. I can't prove he's dead. But So it's not even a good logical fallacy. But Mr. Hogg added that people in Fairborn have something much bigger to focus on. He said, we have a major challenge in relation to Fairborn, and that is to ensure that the council and other public bodies do establish the true cost of the loss to Fairborn do give residents the fullest, especially his virtue signalling, because he wanted to be an MP and he actually lost. Um, he says, I would urge everyone to give Mark Windows a wide berth and ensure we keep our focus on dealing with the real issue of rising sea level and unprepared council. So that's the uh, local MP there who's not well, he's actually is a Labour candidate, not even M an MP. And then it, it let me have my say at the end. So in other words, that people probably haven't even got this far. They said, Mr. Windows, who will host the event, said, we explain that we 
that we are giving facts which people can look up. Nothing is a conspiracy. It's available for the public to find. We're doing a talk there to ignite the people. There is no evidence that the sea levels are rising. He added, I saw a ludicrous press release about Fairborn being decommissioned. We chose Fairborn because it's an example which can be proven wrong. So, so that's what was put into the paper. And then we get this through every you're single letter. You're, you're having too much fun, Mark. Fairborn. Yeah, well, I just thought I wanted to run this by you, Lark, because it's, it's an example of now this is kind of the way communitarianism works in reverse. In other words, right, they assume that they are the majority voice. Now, the funny thing about the protest was this, Lark, the, the, the protest, the protest was one person with two little banners. And I said, would, can we get a photograph of you? And he said, I don't want to be associated with your organization. I said, we're not an organization, we're three individuals. This is Sandy, I'm Mark, and this is Chris who booked the talk. He then scarped off and I, I said, why don't you come in and listen? He said, I'm not listening to your propaganda. I'm not paying to come in. I said, it's free. Now, this is where it gets interesting, right? This is what they put in. Fairborn can see through windows. Every single house in Fairborn had one of this through the door. I'm going to give you some encouraging news in a minute, Lark. That's what this is about, if you're wondering why. It says, in the latest bizarre twist to hit residents of Fairborn. Now, how many bizarre twists have actually hit the residents of Fairborn? I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a totally nonsensical way to open something up. A man called Mark Windows, who puts together his own YouTube recordings, is visiting Fairborn. Now, what has this got to do with me visiting Fairborn? Why are my YouTube recordings anything to do with it? They're nothing to do with it. Windows is one of a small gang of climate change deniers. In other words, we're outside the, the accepted narrative of public opinion. We're outsiders. We're a small gang of climate change deniers. I'm in a gang now, you see. You're a gangster, uh, Who is Mark. intent on visiting the UK's first community. Hey, eh? You're a gangster, my goodness. <laughs> well, yeah. it, this is amazing, isn't it? I mean, I didn't know I was part of a gang because I went down there on my own, you know. And well, said, I, I, it's, it's said, like that here. Yeah, you know, basically. When you, when you mix it up with these locals, yeah. I mean, it's, it, you know, really, you have to realize we're really, we're literally talking about uh, zombies and criminals. A zombie is not in control yeah. of his own mind. That's, that's a definition in brief of a zombie. And, uh, you know, we have to always remember that whether one is a dupe or a shill, the result is the same. We're behind enemy lines. These people, yeah. when I think of a zombie, I liken a zombie to uh, uh, um, what's the word? <clears throat> when a man, when a dog is foaming at the mouth in, in nature. That's a rabid animal, yeah, a rabid yeah, dog. Uh, yeah. That's what I like in a zombie, too. It's a rabid dog, you know. I mean, how are you going to deal with this dog? You either have to shoot it or run away or whatever. One way or another, you've got what a I, What I was going to say, Lark, is this. Yeah, yeah. I was going to give you an example because I was going to give you some more encouraging news about the way that this works and doesn't work, this communitarianism agenda, because... In this case, it actually didn't work despite all this negative publicity. But it says um, that I'm, uh, basically Windows is one of a small gang of climate change deniers who is intent on visiting the UK's first community to be threatened with rising sea levels. Well, they're the first community to be threatened with a policy which will be rolled out everywhere on the back of a lie. That's what it's all about. It says, uh, on top of this, he intends to charge £12 for the experience. Now, they completely made this up because we were going to charge £10 to try and get our money back. Remember, there was meant to be three speakers there. Now, the thing is that he's done that on the size of the hall. So he's thought, well, if 100 people turn up, they'll, they'll make £1,000. Well, actually, we did the event for free and we took about 30 to £40. Pounds. I drove 250 miles to get there. Sandy drove 150 and Basically, Chris paid for the haul and he'd done all the publicity and he put us up for two days and fed us as well. So basically, it said, he says, you couldn't make it up, says local resident Pete Layden. Well, they did make it up, didn't they? Not only is this guy denying the facts about what is happening to our village, he also hopes to make at least a thousand pounds out of us. Complete lie because we did it for nothing. He actually thinks we are going to pay to hear this nonsense well this you see again is an, an opinion now this is meant to be a labor party handout this mariana do we vote labor party 
are in big trouble now. Uh, I've actually posted on their page to ask if Graham Hogg was the author of this. He's not responded and neither have they. And he's now blocked me on Twitter. He blocked me on Twitter before I could even contact him on Twitter. That's what these people are like. They basically throw in all this ad hominem nonsense and then they just run away. Uh, it says, Mr. Windows used to work on People's Voice, created by Davey Icke, the man who famously claimed to be son of the Godhead. Now, what's that got to do with me? If David Icke claims to be son of the Godhead, that's his claim. It's nothing to do with me, is it? So recently, and this you'll like this one, Lark, it, it picks up your last point. More recently, Windows made a recording, Mind Virus Zombies and Climate Change. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it says, with Neil Axel Mourner. A Swede who, as well as denying sea level rises, also claims to possess paranormal abilities. Now, what he didn't say there was Niels Axel Mourner is one of the leading experts in the world in sea levels. He studied sea levels globally for 50 years. The other thing that he's tried to do there is tie Niels to, some, to something paranormal. Now, what it actually says, because, because since Niels left the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and called out their fraud in a document, a very, very powerful document that we've got on our website. Well, what happened was Wikipedia decided to go against him. What a surprise, they went against me. And more on that some other time. I really want to cover it, but please don't use Wikipedia because anybody who's doing any good in the world against this hive mind mentality is absolutely slaughtered on there. I wasn't even allowed to re-edit my own page. Uh, they said I was vandalizing the page and it was a load of slander about me. <laughs> so it says that uh, Niels Axel Mourner, yeah, he claims to possess paranormal abilities. Well, what that was about was that Niels actually said that dowsing works. Now, every water company in the world knows that dowsing works. So this is just a fact. So this is under the belt and this is what they do. They attach you to negative things. They use negative attachments, fallacies like, I suppose you think Elvis lives on the far side of the moon and they use lies uh, and negative attachments. So basically, um, he says, yes, claims to possess paranormal abilities to find water and metal using a dowsing rod. Well, I think millions of people do that and they don't claim to have paranormal abilities. Fairborn resident Roger Duke says, it's an utter disgrace that these people think they can come to our village to trade on our misfortune. Oh dear, the, the, uh, the poor me card comes out just to make money out of us, which we didn't. They should be ashamed of themselves. So they think that's acceptable to do this. And why, the reason I brought all this up, Lark, is because it takes us into what I know has happened to small organizations who've been taken over through communitarian law. And that's what I wanted to get onto next. But basically, th what was great about this was that 60, more than 60 people turned up, they listened, we had people from the village, we had people who were outraged about this, some old lady gave me this, and she said, have you seen what they've written about you, they put it through all our letterboxes, it's a disgrace, so Labour Party Wales, you need now to make an apology about this, but this was what I wanted to get onto, Lark, so I want to give you the floor now. Courts rule against individuals in favour of self-defined community. Now, I can say that the High Court has helped us, but my, my friend's charity was taken over by people who impersonated the trustees. They impersonated the trustees, called themselves a steering committee, and then they got a council on their side using a council building. Yet the real trustees were forced out of the area and threatened. The community police said that nobody would be arrested and they lied. They basically upheld the non-rights of people who broke in the building, stole the contents, libeled the trustees, made their threats and threats of violence. And the police sided with them, basically. It was put into community policing from the Metropolitan Police. Now, I'd like you to take over from here because there's quite a lot of stuff there. Does any of this resonate with you? Well, absolutely. We have to understand that uh, we are being managed via communitarian law enforcement today. We have to remember that the uh, National Defense Authorization Act, Department of Homeland Security, the Patriot Act, all these things were already in writing, in the bag, waiting for 9-11 in this country to be rolled out. We have to remember that when the Department of Homeland Security uh, was created, they actually uh, hired as consultants 
Marcus Wolf of the East German Stasi and uh, Evgeny Primakov from the Soviet KGB as consultants. So we have communitarian law enforcement yeah. in my local area. I got the straight skinny from the vice, uh, from the uh, assistant chief of police. I went to a little meet and greet a little over a year ago up the street at the coffee shop. And uh, the cops, uh, the, the police department wanted to reach out to the community and get to know people because they were looking for people to volunteer their efforts to actually police the neighborhood and uh, spy on their neighbors, just like uh, the, uh, the East German Stasi model. And uh, at this meet and greet, I met all, I met several police officers. They were quite uh, friendly, chatty, and uh, it was a relaxing situation because these people were not on duty. And most people there were there to support the men in blue, the boys in blue, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they all passed out their business cards. Their badge numbers were on those cards. One man, though, was in civilian clothing, and he clearly looked to be part of the camp that was with the police department, and he, too, extended me his card. And what did his card say in lieu of a badge number? It said PHD. And when I mentioned communitarian law to him, this man did not bat an eye. Now, that's my most recent experience. Another experience is there is a uh, popular app for people that live in suburban neighborhoods all over the cities, and there's many like it. And this one is called Nextdoor. And this is a way for the neighborhood to get to know each other and to reach out to each other. When somebody has a lost cat or a lost dog or they want to know the best place to get uh, some service done on the roof of their house or what have you, then people in the neighborhoods use these things. Well, the police department is also a member of this thing called Nextdoor, and they monitor these things through their fusion centers because they want to get a feel for what the people are thinking that live in these neighborhoods. And they're using this data to essentially herd the people into communitarian governance. And this is self-policing of each other. This is only just one or two examples. That's absolutely of right. And when it comes to the courts, we have to understand that in this country, for example, I have been one of the few people that have pointed out in alternative media uh, pathways over the past 10 years that there was a, 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 a quite notable law professor at Harvard University for 40 years by the name of Harold Berman. You can look him up. He was a, he recently passed away a few years ago, but he was a noted Soviet legal expert. When he finished his time and received his uh, retirement after a long time tenure as a tenured uh, law professor there at Harvard, he spent 20 years more at Emory University in Atlanta. And you, I did all kinds of research on this man, his, with his writings, his, uh, his speeches, and everything else but this is a man who's been teaching American law students for 60 years what but communitarian law we have the example of the late you see uh, US Supreme Court Justice yeah. Antonin Scalia who was invited to be a faculty member of the international oh, excuse me at the American uh, uh, what is it called uh, The American Institute. Not quite sure, but what I wanted to say was that from now Talmudic and Internet and American law. I'll think of the name in just a moment. Please forgive me. Go ahead. Right. Okay. Yeah. You asked about communitarian law. I'm just telling you where it comes from. They've taken over the yeah, courts. That's, that's interesting because in the U yeah in, in the UK we have children being given speed camera guns. I covered it about a year ago. And also, what we also have is these pensioners who, when you're going through country villages, these senior citizens, they jump out in the road with these speed cam cameras, really proud of themselves. So they're empowering these, yeah, as you call them. I've been told off a bit about using the term useful idiots because I was using it all the time. And um, so we've tried to soften it a little bit. But, um, but basically, that's what it is. It's, it's everyone working for the hive mind. And the, interestingly, I couldn't find too much about communitarian law on the internet, 
but it is actually embedded in the institutions and this is where a lot of it is to be found what you said there is absolutely fascinating because this is where i found it and also obviously through these hundreds and thousands of ngos all over the world which was really where i started to see the the broad implementation of this hive mind communitarian agenda and let me course, let me see if i can help up uh, let me see if i can in, in, sorry yes let me see if I can help you and the listeners look uh, determine where to find communitarian law and the evidence for it. Uh, yeah, that would be all, really helpful. That would be really helpful, yeah. Yeah, first of all, the, 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 the thing I was trying to remember that I couldn't quite uh, capture was called, it is called the Institute of American and Talmudic Law. And that's IATlaw.org. Click on faculty, scroll all the way down the page, you'll see a group photo. And the late Justice Antonin Scalia is right in the center of that group photo. So apparently he was invited to discuss the, uh, the, uh, the vagaries of Talmudic law and how it was probably a superior form of law than American law. Because American law is thought to be, uh, you know, outdated and old hat. So the other thing you can do is you can go into the law schools. Any, any university that has a law school and then look at their journals that they keep, that they are proud of and they like to publish. And these are generally um, um, dissertation uh, documents. They're uh, uh, articles by law professors. And generally they're for people that are interested in matters concerning the law. And uh, where I stu what I stumbled upon is something called um, the Law Review of Brigham Young University. This is where I got educated, and their journals go all the way back to the 70s. And uh, right about the late 80s, early 90s, is when you start seeing the appearance of this word communitarian more and more. And what they're enamored with nowadays is what they call soft law or reflexive law. But do, your, do yourselves a favor. The other thing, too, is to just simply go online and do a search for European Union law. This is the law of the European Union. It's also called EU law or community law by your big media pundits and your sock puppets. Uh, but this is, more, this is nothing more than a euphemism for the French acquis communautaire translated into English. That's communitarian law. This is the law of the European Union which is more than 70 years in the making. And this is the law which is being superimposed over and upon all nation states, all nationalist laws around the world right now. Does that help? Yeah, that's absolutely true. And that's great to have those references because that's really helpful. Yes, a lot of this stuff is difficult for the public to see because it's not openly talked about. It's kind of open infiltration it's infiltration of every organization so if you're watching the television say the bbc you'll see communitarianism on there all day long but you don't know what it is and this is the point that when i started seeing these change agents they were so radically different from the people i knew because the people i know and associate with are all individuals and what this is about is destroying the rights of the individual for the collective and whenever you hear collectivism watch out because that means that you're going to be steered into something which you may not know about and you may not want. And in the case of what's happening in the UK, the citizens' assemblies are the absolute outcome of communitarianism. They are the controlling of the narrative in the totalitarianism respect because they're all about controlling the narrative of public opinion and forcing the public into accepting things that they wouldn't normally accept. But that's for the common good. And I talked about this on the Jason Lee Asato show last night. The common good means that it appears that society is functioning in the correct way. It doesn't mean that it's good for anybody. It means that it's good because it looks as though society is functioning. And that's the whole thing. Things like social equity, social justice. Well, these, these words are used, they're all communitarianism terms. And I started seeing this in groups that were forming through NGOs and through these communitarianism groups, such as 
unlimited locality intentionality citizens uk they're mentoring everybody into it from eight to 80 this is what they say i've seen it rolled out it's been rolled out everywhere all over the country in the uk every town city and village has got this communitarianism agenda i've been all over the country i've even been in small country village churches and it's there spy programs are in place there's change <coughs> agents everywhere it's a virus that's taken over everything and the only way around it is to reclaim sovereignty yeah sorry oh, yeah. in a nutshell communitarianism is organized crime made legal that's what it is it is a system of human child sex drug and organ trafficking made legal it is indeed a type of totalitarianism even despotism yeah. and the people are being unwittingly led to as those bison of the North American Plains that were driven to the edge of an abyss to the cliff to meet their deaths and their eventual harvest by the Indians. It's called a buffalo jump. You get people to herd in a direction and they have no idea that they are sliding down that communitarian slope because they are ignorant. They're just ignorant. And I'm talking about the people that think they're so damn smart that are on your telly. You know, that right- Well, these are the people that they paper. want. These are the people that the Soviets these are people the Soviets defined as useful idiots because they wanted people who were narcissistic. Now, if you look at Extinction Rebellion, it's a narcissistic theater. It's not a protest. It's street theater mixed with narcissism. And that's why it's cleverly constructed because this is what is called the system of moods. So basically it's taking over everything. And yes, it is criminal because what happened to my friend's charity is organized crime under the terrorism act of 2000 and when you get the community policing saying that nobody is going to be arrested even when there was police reports and police crime numbers for assaults criminal damage and theft of all, all the property in the building and the taking over of that building which was owned by a, a trust that was formed in 1920 and those people who were coming in on the back of a communitarian agenda ruined that building they 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 stole everything out of the building and now they're still trying to take it it's incredible and this is happening all over the place i know up and down the country small charities small organizations have been targeted by these people and they will come in and kick you out of your own business your own organization or your own charity so this is very extreme at the extreme end at the other end of it which is your local community you'll find that it's about spying and infiltrating everything. So my advice is not to get involved with any of these people and form your own underground groups because that's the only way to do it. We put ourselves out publicly because all the information that I give is in the public domain. I found it. If there's anything that's that needs to be done as far as behind the scenes with people, I, I would recommend that they don't put it into the public until they're actually going to act because this communitarian agenda is absolutely infiltrated. It's infiltrated everything, every organization. And it's quite incredible. But since 2010 in this country, it has taken over everything. It was slower before 2010, but from then onwards, with the formation of these NGOs and these charities and organizations, these umbrella groups, Power to Change, who are an umbrella group, a lot of it's national lottery funded, the Esme Fairburn Foundation who are involved with Sortition, My Society, um, and the Involve, Involve is an, an organization using Delphi technique which is implementing citizens' assemblies. Now, why are, why are the public appearing to vote to retrofit their houses at 25,000 pounds each? 25,000 pounds for starters on each person's house. They've just voted for it in these citizens' assemblies. The citizens' assembly in Oxford, the, the, the expert panel was made up of lobbyists for the mitigation industry, the climate change mitigation industry, and a fellow called Miles Allen, who was rebuked by a judge in California for lying and making it appear that there was 10,000 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. 
He was severely rebuked by the judge and he also presented false data. Miles Allen works for the IPCC as a computer modeler, which means that he predicts weather patterns for the future. The reason that weather patterns for the future and the temperature is going to go up by three or four degrees and all the rest of it is because they're making it up. Now, that's the whole point. It's totalitarian in the respect that the outcome is already predicted. There is no choice. And that's where people can start fighting back and say, no, this is not true. You can only do this, though, if you get organized. And, and this sort of slander, it doesn't always work. I've had this sort of thing for years. It's happened to me for years. It happened to me when I was the People's Voice TV. I know exactly now how it works. And uh, Lark is going to be on some more shows in the future. We've got a lot more to talk about on this subject. But I'm going to give you the last word here, Lark, because we, we were going to do a two-hour show, but I think we should do it fairly short. We get more attention if we do slightly shorter ones, I think. So do you want to round up? Well, you know, there's a part of me that wants to, I mean, this is, this, you, you mentioned about street theater and the like. Well, you know, I kind of think this is just a, you know, a gigantic comedy that we're all witnessing some days. Yes. Uh, I myself have uh, thought that I should declare myself an endangered species, just like the prairie dog. And, uh, you know, you know, opt out, you know, but somehow I feel uh, honor bound to, uh, you know, to, you know, somehow help all of these uh, zombies and criminals, these unwitting dupes see their way out of this miasma that they've somehow caught themselves up in. Another time, uh, I've thought that I should probably be, be like uh, Thomas Paine, become a pamphleteer and publish something called Common Sense, but I'm going to call it Post-Truth News. And the tagline is, we do all, uh, we lie constantly so you don't have to. And then make sure that all the suits in the, in the downtown Dallas area where I live, all those success-driven people in their power suits, their business suits, their jackets and ties, make sure they get one in their hands. And let these son of a bitches know that we're on to their con. And that includes all these politicos that deign to think that they have the right to think for me or you or anybody else. These people, ladies and gentlemen, are simply not qualified to think for you at all. We'll leave it there. Thanks, Lark. That was brilliant. And we're going to do a lot more on this. I was talking to Jason Leosatos last night outside the box, and we touched on some of this stuff of how... Uh, systems of management are put into place and there's a huge administrative system. We've basically got a small elite at the top, the, the priest class are now just billionaires and really we have people who haven't got that much wisdom who are in this elite class. Um, but they do know a lot about social engineering and social engineering what's, what is what this is all about. We have a huge administrative sector. Now, the idea of this administrative sector is to control the narrative of all public opinion. So if you're in that administrative sector, and you want to do something about it then get outside the box and start looking in at what's going on because the problem is with this is that it creates intolerance within the individual the individual becomes intolerant when i tried to put some points to a change agent in waltham forest in northeast london who just turned up to take over a local market i said well the idea that co2 drives temperature has never been proven and she said I choose not to hear that. We're talking about complete intolerance here, and you come up against this all the time. These people are pretty evil in the respect that they're being used as vessels for this agenda. And I've been on the receiving end of it many times. I know how to handle these people. You have to keep bringing it back to the facts. Which of the facts are not having ad hominem attacks against me? The, this issue is not about me. It's not nothing to do with me. Same as this was nothing to do with me. It was to do with the world's leading expert in sea levels, but they attacked me. Then they attacked him as though he wasn't an expert. You have to keep reiterating this and also make sure that they validate every single statement they make. So that's a bit of advice there. And that's how I've dealt with some of it. I've won several court cases against local councils. Things are ramping up. The whole country's been re-engineered under the UN Agenda 21, Agenda 2030 policies. There's a wild 11 conference next month in Jaipur, which puts 
50% of the world's land and oceans into the stewardship under the UN, into stewardship under the UN, which basically means privatization. So what we have is a corporate agenda that's rolled out locally, and this communitarianism is a big part of it. It's the big part of it. It's what I call a hive mind. So thanks to everyone who's been in chat, and these Wednesday shows are really picking up. And do support us on Patreon if you can. Uh, we're trying to keep going and we're doing a lot of stuff which is actually going to be in our talks. We take this all over the country. If you'd like to book a talk, the Real Citizens Assembly, get in touch through windowsontheworld.net. And I'm off to have a bit of a rest. We've been on the road for quite a few days. And I was burnt out before last night's interview and I've been studying all day. So <laughs> I'm going to go and have something to eat. Join us at 9 p.m. on Sunday and 8 p.m. on Wednesday. Thanks to Lark in Texas. And that's good night from me and good night from Lark in Texas. <laughs> and Lark's going to be on the show again very soon. Thanks a lot and good night. Hello, everyone. This is Shai from Israel, raising the frequency. And I'm here today with a special guest. And actually, this is his first time on video. <laughs> Maybe you do know him from audio files and audio recordings and interviews. Um, but today, he managed to do a video. And uh, I'm very proud and happy to introduce you to Lark in Texas, which will speak with us about, let me see if I can say this word, communitarianism. Um, hi, Lar. Good morning in Israel and good night <laughs> in Texas. How are you doing? Actually, uh, good morning. How are you? It is actually morning in Texas, right. uh, about about one fifteen in the morning. Right. So here it's nine fifteen. We have like eight hours difference. And just I will say a quick word for the viewers. What you see here on my nose, it just uh, I bang my nose with a set of pliers by mistake. So now it's better, but I just I still have a small scar. Uh, don't worry, I'm all right. So I think the the subject today is very interesting because it's to do with ideology and it's to do with a set of thought or a way of thinking and, and it's being basically put in our lives without us noticing it and but it, Instead of me describing it in the wrong way, I let you do it the right way. So, please go ahead, Lark. What is communitarianism? Well, let me begin by saying that this is a searchable word. And it comes from the word commune or community. Communitarian. Anytime you see a word that has a suffix ism, mm -hmm. that's an ending suffix, that simply means school of thought. So it's it's important not to be bamboozled because we're dealing with a multisyllabic word. Mm. It's only a word. Yeah. And of course, it's, de it's defined in the dictionaries and encyclopedias both philosophically and ideologically. However, it is a school of thought, which is to say that within every school of thought, there will always be variances of opinion. That's important to take note of. Yeah. Now, communitarianism has been described as the final solution, the synthesis between capitalism and communism. One of the buzzwords of the 80s and the 90s was this word convergence. Mm -hmm. And it's still being bandied about. And the idea was to bring together in balance and in harmony the schools of thought, particularly the economic, socio-political systems of the East and the West, so that there could be a unifying system of law and of government. But what we see today is that governments are going by the wayside. The nation states are going by the wayside in favor of what we call the market state. And the market state is a globalized market state. We live in a time of instant communication. The world is a much smaller place because of the new technologies that we live with in our lives today. Mm -hmm. So the uh, 
Hegelian dialectic plays a large part in this. And that's nothing more than problem, reaction, solution, or thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Yes. And of course, when we're dealing with the Hegelian dialectic, it's not anything mystifying. There is a problem. It's identified. Pick a problem, any problem. There's going to be an expected reaction. There is a reaction to the problem. So uh, it's thought that a solution needs to be arrived at and a solution needs to be sought to resolve this difficulty, this problem. Yeah. Very often it involves consensus or compromise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oftentimes in today's world, though, a problem can be manufactured. Yeah. Okay, when we say communism versus or plus capitalism equals communitarianism, we can switch the thesis and the antithesis. We can switch the problem and the reaction. It could be either or. In other words, capitalism plus yes. communism or communism plus capitalism yes. stands to reason, yes? Yes. Well, uh, you know, since the early part of the 20th century, we've had uh, a communist system in place. In 1949, the People's Republic of China was formed. It was a communist system. So we have a large swath of the world, a, a, a large landmass that has operated for a number of years under a system that we euphemistically or generally know as communism. Uh, of course, we were told that the Soviet Union uh, was dissolved a right around 1991, yeah. but really it wasn't. The, you know, some people may say, well, the deck chairs of the Titanic were rearranged is all. Mm. But uh, yeah, so communitarianism is important to remember in today's world because we very seldom actually hear the word or read the word in print. And it's by design. What you're going to hear is what I term communitarian code speak. Uh, which is a takeoff from Orwellian Newspeak or Doublethink. Mm. These are terms of art, words, and phrases that are bandied about in uh, think tanks, in uh, foreign and domestic policy circles, uh, within foundations, uh, even within the media, uh, within every field of human endeavor, in fact. But they are words that you think mean one thing, but they mean entirely something different, especially for the people who are steeped in the language, the particular dogma of their industry or occupational group. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, you might hear the words quality learning. Well, quality of learning means something entirely different to people in education policy circles than it does to the average listener or reader of those two words, quality learning. It has a specific meaning, in mm -hmm. fact. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you want to learn about education policy, you know, you can learn, you can visit a website called invisiblesurfscaller.com. Uh, that's Robin Eubank. She's a securities attorney from Atlanta, Georgia. She wrote a book, you can find it on Amazon, called Credential to Destroy, How and Why Education Became a Weapon. And she's one of my correspondents. Uh, also, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, do a search for people like Charlotte Iserby uh, in the United States. Uh, I-S-E-R-B-Y-T, Charlotte Iserby. She was in the Reagan administration. But we have seen a convergence really since at least the end of World War II and with the creation of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. So we have to uh, wrap our minds around that. This, the mm -hmm. stated aim of the United Nations has always been a one world system of management or governance. Yes. So remember the watchword today is not government, it's governance. And what's, I like to say governance. Governance is management. In fact, if somebody was to ask me, what is the definition of communitarianism? I would say it was the scientific dictatorship of the community. Which is, which is, well, 
in a way it's like te technocracy or it's very similar what what's the relation between communitarianism and technocracy i mean if there is any relation between these two worlds and their meanings well we can put it this way a friend of mine put it this way uh road warrior radio chris hinckley the broadcast host he lives in uh montana mm -hmm. small town montana usa he likens uh technocracy to being the hardware and communitarianism to be the software. Oh, clever. <laughs> nice. But hang on, all right. And is, I mean, I know government is the, is basically to do with the mind, is to control the mind, is to feed the mind. Mind control. Say again? Mind control. Mind control, yes. And so when you're saying govern, govern, governance, yes? We're speaking of the word management, very simply. Right. So it's management of the mind? Management of the system. Right. It takes a lot of people to manage the system. Yeah. With seven billion people on this, in this plane of existence, I mm -hmm. like to say anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, so the nation state is going by the wayside. This will give rise to the market state, the globalized market state. Mm -hmm. And in turn, we will also see the rise of the city-state, smart cities, yes. okay? The idea is to bring people together into large uh, metroplexes and or population centers because it's, it's thought that they can be controlled more easily. Yes. They want to bring people off of the land. And uh, they say they want to rewild the land. Because, of course, going back to the Club of Rome white papers from the late 60s and the early 70s, sure. uh, we, need, we, need a, we need something to replace war. Well, we're going to have to have a war on terror and we're going to have to have, um, you know, the human being who is waging war upon his environment. Sure. The, 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 the enemy is you, the humans, you know, the, the enemy is the human being. Yes, and I like to jokingly say, well, I want the same rights as a prairie dog. A prairie dog has been declared an endangered species. Yes. <laughs> so, but uh, um, so that's important to recognize, okay? There's, you don't need to attach a lot of words to this. There are people that have attached thousands and millions of words to these questions and these answers. But it's important that we grasp the information as best we can, mm -hmm. and we need to adjust our lives accordingly so that we're not swept up into a system in which personal autonomy uh, exercise of free will, uh, true freedom of choice, and things like liberty and freedom do not die for the individual. Because you and I, as individuals, we care about such things, mm -hmm. our personal autonomy. But see, communitarianism is a system of arrested development. Arrested development means that your choices in life are narrowed deliberately. And uh, the other thing that's important to remember about communitarianism is that the social engineers, the behaviorists, the sociologists, the economists, etc., these people want to engineer the buy-in. In other words, they want you and I to go along with the plan because it just makes sense. They, they, they said, you said, sorry, they want to engineer the what? The buy-in? The, the buy-in. In other words, you need to buy the propaganda. Right. You need to buy their justifications for what they are doing. All right. Okay? Yes, which is and the, which is the um, um, smart city or uh, what's the name? <laughs> I forgot. Well, we, have name. To, we have to save the planet. Yes, yes. Which is, we, we, in a way, this is Agenda 21. It's coming into place. This is like the blueprint in how to do it. But you're saying that, if I put it in my words, the ideology to Agenda 21 is communitarianism? It is absolutely it, is. Is it right? All right, all right. That's what, that's what I wanted to, to understand. Of course. of course. All right. Now, people will say, well, why should I care about this word? Well, you know, I am not qualified to tell anybody how to think. Mm. 
you know, I am not that type of a person that is going to try to ram my thoughts and my ideas down your throat or anybody else's. Uh, but what I would do, what I would encourage people to do is they need to look at what the people in academia are talking about. Mm. Now, people like you and I, we've been removed from academia for many years, for some time. Mm. But we have to be cognizant of the fact that people that are under the age of 40 say they are steeped in this stuff. Yeah. Okay, they're getting it from, uh, you know, kindergarten, if you will. Yes. In fact, in education policy circles, it's called P20. That's preschool all the way through graduate school. And truly what it is, is cradle to grave uh, system. Indoctrination of these ideas. I mean, nothing yes. else, but to keep to keep the academic, well, whoever is in the academic life and professional life, to keep them in a uh, horse glasses. I don't know how you call them in, in English, but uh, to indoctrinate them into a specific set of thought or school of thought. I mean, now it's communitarianism, yes. but it can be other things as well over the years. Well, you can look at any problem or difficulty you're having in your life and ask yourself, well, why can't I improve upon the situation and or change it? Okay? And when, you, when, you, when there is a source outside of yourself that seems to be the source of the problem, and then those problems multiply, then we all of a sudden we feel, you know, like we're kind of locked in. Yeah. And see, communitarianism is, uh, I've defined it in a lot of different ways. In fact, because it's, 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 it's said to be an all-encompassing school of thought, okay? This is where the rub is, because this affords maximum malleability in the use of the language to control the population and the individual. It's done in the, it's done in the, in the, uh, the language of the law, and it's done, again, within every field of human endeavor. Because remember, this idea of communitarianism, it started, it was coined in 1841 wow. by a man named John Goodwin Barmby. Now, John Goodwin Barmby was a contemporary of Frederick Engels and Karl Marx. Right, yes. Okay. Uh, in 1841 was published a pamphlet called What is Property? by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, in which he described ownership of property as being tantamount to theft. In 1841 was uh, a forgotten book written by one Clinton Roosevelt, and it was called The Science of Government Founded on Natural Law. Hmm. A forgotten so, book. <laughs> yeah. So it, it turns out that uh, Mr. Barnby had quite an influence on Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Hmm. Okay, he is the one that actually introduced Frederick Engels to French communisme in a trip to Paris. And, uh, you know, but uh, always remember, it was, it's the people who can fund, fund these disparate groups who are behind all of this stuff. Because you need to have uh, the ability to induce or coerce other people to do your bidding. Sure. Uh, you know, we plan our lives based on where our next buck is coming from. Yes. You see? So who, who was, I mean, back then, who was funding it? Well, I think it starts out as individual movements, but, you know, we have to look at the actions of people like uh, Robert Owen. There's a whole history of socialism. There's a whole timeline of communitarianism that we can look at. You know, it's been a, uh, it's been Christian, it's been Jewish, it's been many different uh, groups that have, mm -hmm. that have uh, uh, played around with, say, utopian societies. Okay, and uh, they they've experimented. In the in the United States, for instance, the social gospel movement was huge amongst uh, different different uh, denominational sects within Protestantism. Hmm. And uh, there are many examples of uh, communal living, community life, communal life 
I mean, in Europe, you know, there was the uh, example of the commune. Yes. In fact, today in Europe, the commune is the, is the smallest unit of political organization, especially in places like France and in Switzerland. Right. Uh, you know, you're a Jewish man, so you know about kibbutz. Yes. You know, well, the Ganya, yeah. for whatever it's worth, it's, the oldest uh, kibbutz in Israel. Uh, it's really, it was it's really close to here. It's like uh, 15 minutes drive from me, you know. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's been privatized as of the last six or eight years. Well, many kibbutzes, And, many kibbutz in Israel have been privatized or privatized or how you say it. Uh, yes. Yeah, but this is because of changing of times and capitalism etc i mean it was also right. a necessity because a lot of them lost money and became a burden on the system instead of being independent yes uh, uh, yes go on <laughs> and i can see that yeah yeah um i don't know where to take this next because there's so, so many different directions i have a question i have I, i'll help you a couple of questions in the in the 20th century i mean there was the tavistock institute How or if at all the Tavistock Institute used the ideology of communitarianism in its way to social engineer um, the people? Well, you know, there are different groups, too. There was the Frankfurt School in Germany yes, yes. that, uh, you know, uh, uh, mostly immigrated um, during when the National Socialists came to power. They came to New York. Yeah. at Columbia University, other places. Uh, I'll give you a quick story about Tavistock yeah, during World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that was headed by um, Brigadier General, later Major General, John Rollins Reese. All right. And uh, he worked with a man named C.K. Ogden. C.K. Ogden was a linguist. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came up with something called basic English. And his theory was that the... Uh, the English-speaking peoples of the world, centered in the Anglo-American establishment, if you will, would have a better uh, opportunity to take over the world if they were to reduce this English language down to about 650 words, of which 200 or 250 were nouns. The only other nouns which were permitted within this schema were of people's names. proper names of places, things, So, so you, you're cetera. talking about linguistically dumbing down the masses? Yes. This That's is... why English, to, English today is the language of commerce, almost universal, yes. worldwide. And there's a reason for that. It makes me want to cry, man. So, it's sad, you know. I, I... Well, it doesn't have to be. I think it starts with awareness. You know, once you're aware of your terrain, your surroundings, the cultural, economic, political milieu in which you try to navigate this life, then you can make better decisions. And that's really the whole point of our having these conversations. Yes. Because we all want the best for ourselves, our family members, our loved ones, our children, and our progeny. Okay? The uh, communitarians believe that... Um, Uh, we have entered into a time in which a scientific dictatorship is of necessity. Yeah. Okay? And there's a lot of junk science out there. There's a lot of faux science out there today. Yeah. You know, within academia, amongst philosophers, um, you know, there's a lot of moral relativism today. You know, if moral relativism is based in objective reality, then what about tr things like truth? You might have heard that one of the Oxford English Dictionary's words of the year was post-truth. Really? No, I, I, did, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, you can look <laughs> that up. That's excellent. Post-truth. Right. Post-truth. <laughs> well, I mean, this goes to uh, ph philosophers, you know, the trajectory of philosophers yes. over time, not just in the West, but in the East. You know, we can look at the, uh, you know, people like Hegel, We could uh, look at people like Kant. Uh, we can look at people like Ludwig Wittgenstein and also uh, Jacques Derrida, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, there's a lot of interesting, you know, I personally uh, was a military brat. My, my parents were in the Air Force mm -hmm. when I came into the world. 
and we lived overseas for a time. And uh, so I, I had a different kind of a worldview than a lot of people who didn't have that kind of experience. Cool. You know, mm. and for example, I studied martial arts as a child. Mm. And uh, I was in the Cub Scouts and I played Little League Baseball and, uh, you know, and, um, uh, you know, but I fell in love with uh, Oriental arts, mm. uh, specifically Japanese and Chinese arts and, mm. uh, you know, calligraphy yes. and uh, poetry yeah. and uh, music and so many things, you know. And as I got older, I realized that I could appreciate cultures no matter where I lived in the whole world. Sure. Because there's yeah. something beautiful about everything and everybody. Sure, I agree. So okay. I'm one of these people that kind of likes everybody. You yeah. know? <laughs> nice one. And of course, you know, I was a, I was a cook until I was 40 years old. And mm. to me, that was the most important, exciting thing anybody could possibly do with their life. Because I got to meet people from many cultures from around the world. And uh, I mean, that was an education. And it was just thrilling. You know, it was a very difficult life. But uh, I chose it. So, and, uh, so, so, so what brought you to, I mean, how many years you know about communitarianism and it's the, ideo the ideology behind it? And what brought you to investigate it, to research it and to put all these pieces of information together? In, uh, let's see, I... I I got out of the food service industry in 1994 when I was 40 years old and I was looking for something else to do. I thought about doing theatrical productions with food. I wanted to do uh, culinary art, but I wanted to appeal to well-to-do people that could fund elaborate stage productions, mm -hmm. big parties, if you will. Instead, what happened is, is I got into the food service equipment business right. acc accidentally. And so I did that for about 12 years. I had a successful company. I had a dozen employees. I made a pretty good living. And, um, you know, to make a long story short, I decided that this wasn't for me because I didn't, I didn't have a life and I, and I wasn't passionate about what I was doing. Making money wasn't everything, in other words. Yes. But uh, I discovered this word the first year I ever got online, which was in 2004. In 2004, you came across the word communitarianism. I discovered it. What do you mean you discovered it? Well, I'm, you know, like a lot of people do, they, they're inquisitive, they start searching on the internet, mm -hmm. and I was brand new to the internet. Right. I was yes. a mature man, I wasn't a child. Yes, and, yes, yes, uh, in yes, fact, true. Sure. And I, I actually had, uh, you know, my employees kept telling me I need to get on the internet. I need to get on the internet. I didn't want to. So we're talking, we're talking 15 years ago. So it's been now 15 years since you yeah. are, well, at first aware of this world or you discover this world and its meaning. And then it took you down the rabbit hole of exploring or researching the, the connections of this world to day-to-day -day life. Absolutely. And so I've been a full-time researcher for 15 years on this topic and this one topic alone. Wow. But obviously it's connected to everything because... It does. Because if it I understand connects. what you're saying, it influences, and never mind influences, it will influence much more in the coming years because it's a plan being unfolded without our knowledge in order to... I would say pervert linguistic capabilities and through that the mind, our mind, because what it does, it's messing with our mind, which is social engineering, really. We're being socially engineered. Um, you know something, um, there's two English language words. The first is enculturate. Enculturate can be described as a mother teaching a child to use a fork. Right. Okay. Acculturate, spelled A-C, culturate, right. is when another foreign, alien, ah. outside force subverts your culture, your traditions, and your world 
and forces you to think like they think. So we are at once being enculturated and acculturated. Because there's a many forces coming together that seem that are outside of our awareness yes. that yes. are coalescing. Remember, this Hegelian dialectic is going on all the time. Yes, yes. Sure. It's not just an external phenomenon, it's an internal phenomenon. Mm. Yes. Internal to your mind. Sure. Okay. And uh, you know, we can't disconnect from the world. We are psychophysical beings, we're physio physiological units. Back in the sixties, they were we were referred to as tubes, open ended tubes. And now we have the words useless eater being bandied about. <laughs> yes. Oh, useful idiots, depends, you know. Where this is heading, Shai, is frankly, the overarching agenda uh, is depopulation and techno-slavery. Yeah. Okay, techno-slavery, we have to define terms. What is a technology, first of all? Uh, a technology um, can be language itself. Because that may be man's oldest technology. Remember, it may not have been the spoken word sure. that was the earliest forms of language. Sure. You know, much of uh, language uh, was uh, biomimicry, if you will. Yeah. You see, uh, different tribes and clans coming together and they pick things up and they, they pick up sounds from nature and they want to recreate. Either way, they have this yearn to want to communicate. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Okay. But a technology can be a rock. It can be a piece of flint. It can be a spear, an axe, an anvil, a lever, yeah. an axe. Okay. Um, but it can also be our love affair with machines. Okay. And I actually think that artificial intelligence and the computer sciences big tech, if you will, I think it's actually going to work against mankind. Sure, because I mean, what we have learned is yeah. deleterious even to our physical health. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, yeah, Dr. Still, Martin this, Paul. Say again, Martin Paul. Yes. Uh, yes, I interviewed him as well a couple of months ago. Yes. Um, and, and many others who really also speak about the same thing from different angles, whether it's the hardware and technology side, whether it's the scientific and biological side, whether it's your side, which is more ideology. I mean, I find it fascinating the way you put things together, you know, because one can relate to the subject or not, although obviously it's related to everyone. But the way you put things together, I find it fascinating because it's to speak about what I already know from a different angle, from a linguistic angle, angle from an ideology, uh, ideological angle, and to understand that the dumbing down and depopulation and getting us hooked or addicted to technology, and in that process, harming our biology and our functioning in the day-to-day. -day. I mean, we are... We are amazing creatures, really. We, are, we were given all this to, to use, not to destroy, but to use. And there's a bunch of us who may think that this is their right, but not, not our right. So they are like the um, chosen ones, whether they are this elite or that elite. And I'm not talking about the... Uh, um, we can go there also, maybe, I don't know if in this talk or another one, but I'm not talking about the, the, um, the Jewish people who may think or say that they are the chosen ones by God, but I'm talking about royal families who've been running things here for thousands of years and managed to manipulate us into thinking that we are free, and on a relative terms, we are more free than before, but still we are enslaved in a very sophisticated ways, which now, from what you're saying, I'm thinking, well, A, it's good, English is not my mother tongue, in a way. <laughs> I find it now comforting, you know, 
for many years I wanted to know better English and better English. But also I've been reading some other books about how the English language has been used to dumb down people and how many secrets are in the English language if you um, take the word and opposite it. And obviously it's coming also from the Hebrew language, etc. I don't want to go there right now, but basically, in a way I'm happy that English is not my mother tongue and at the same time I can see how all the education system is being put there by what's his name? Uh, Downey? Dowdy? I forgot his name. Uh, Lace American? Mike, say, American? American, yes, yes. John Dewey. John Dewey, yes, thank you. So, and you read uh, about what he was doing in the education system and how or who he was in touch with. And it's to do with the Tavistock Institute and it's to do with the with what we're talking about now, communitarianism. But I never heard about communitarianism um, before, at least until Here, a couple he, of weeks ago. This is when the light bulb went off in my head. Um, I was interested in communitarian law. And so I chanced upon a discovery that I can go onto a university's website into their law school and I could read their law journals. And you can too. Your listeners can as well. Yeah. Now, I first got my f first taste by going to Brigham Young University. It was really just accidentally, happenstance. And of course, that's a Mormon university, but they have a law review uh, journal and uh, entries. They're usually these are uh, doctoral candidates and uh, professors that submit these things for publication going back to the 60s and the 70s. But uh, then, too, I looked at the trajectory, the growth of what became the European Union. Now, this was uh, something that, uh, remember, Europe is uh, smaller than, I think, the United States, for instance. But there's all these different countries and all these different languages. Yeah. A European today has to speak uh, two or three languages just to get by. Yes. You know, Americans are quite uh, parochial. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they don't travel as much as other people in the world and, yeah. and things like that. And so, uh, I mean, they speak an American kind of an English. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's different in different parts of the country. Yeah. You know, widely different. But, um, well, then I discovered that EU law was communitarian law. There's the connection. Wow. If you're in France, you know it as acquis communautaire. If you're English, you know it as communitarian law. So EU law is used euphemistically in the newspapers as either EU law or community law. Wow. And so this word community, just like this word sustainable or sustainability, has actually become a weaponized meme yeah. in our culture today. Because yeah. when we talk about warfare, because we are being warred upon yes. individually, uh, we're talking about cyber warfare. And this goes to uh, cyberspace and cybernetics, which we should touch upon. Okay. Norbert Wiener, MIT, post-World War II, the Macy Conferences, okay, he repopularized this word cybernetics. Mm. Uh, then, uh, um, I lost my train, forgive me, where was I? But, but, but basically, everything... Oh, warfare, the types of warfare. warfare. And weaponized tools, you know? I mean, well, I, I style it this way. It's cyber, psychological, biological, um, economic spiritual and memetic and what? there's a couple others memetic what's memetic it comes from meme theory right meme is a meme is a word that was coined by the atheist richard dawkins in a 1976 tome entitled the selfish gene hmm. it became very very popular yeah okay uh within academia and especially within uh um advertising and marketing circles, believe right. it or not. Yes, makes sense also. <laughs> yes. So these are types of warfare that are being waged against us today. And uh, another one is called nonlinear warfare. On What's YouTube that? today, 
on YouTube today, you can look it up. Nonlinear warfare, a new system of political control. And basically, it was a, ba a man by, who was an advisor to Alexander um, or Vladimir Putin named Surkov, mm -hmm. Vladislav Surkov. Mm. And uh, the idea was, uh, well, you should watch it. It explains all these so-called uh, false flag events. Right. You know, these artificial manufactured events. Nonlinear is one word. Nonlinear, linear. Warfare. Uh, warfare. A new system of political control. Now, this comes from a documentary f from BBC and Adam Curtis called uh, um, Hyper Normalization. Remember, we had a Soviet defector back in, I think, the 70s. Mm -hmm. Yuri Bezmanov was his name. All right. And uh, he described how the Soviets, uh, or the communists, if you will, Uh, sought to undermine and to uh, destroy the foundations of Western capitalist societies. Yes. yes. And so he talked about, uh, I'm trying to think of the four words, uh, there was first uh, demoralization. Yeah, but I've, I've seen this video, I know it. Also, we have it. So you uh, know it, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, I will tell the, the Hebrew speaking uh, um, audience that this video is actually was translated to Hebrew roughly eight or nine years ago. By, mm -hmm. by, a, by a friend of mine, all right? So um, mm -hmm. uh, he's doing also great work here in Israel, exposing a lot of the big capital BS that is happening around the world and in Israel. But basically, this video is excellent. I, he's a former KGB, right? Um, or, yes. Yes, so I've seen it, and it's uh, almost unbelievable. <laughs> but you have to believe it. But it's almost unbelievable. But go on. So let's say I've watched this. Well, video. The, title, the, the title of the documentary by Adam Curtis goes to the fourth stage the, of what Yebezinov describes, mm -hmm. which is normalization. Right. Hence the title, hyper-normalization. Yes. See, we live in a speeded up world. Uh, man today consumes more media than at any other time in human history. Absolutely. Yes. So we have to recognize that. Uh, there is a phenomenon called continuous partial attention. LindaStone.net. Continuous partial attention. <laughs> and I think clever. this internet, internet culture fosters and promotes that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Our attention spans today are like that of fleas. Yes. I understand at one time it was 12 seconds and it was eight seconds. I don't know what it is today. But, you know, we see, we expect instant gratification in yeah. this culture today. You know, hence the growth of firms like Amazon. I mean, the idea of people actually going out and, you know, creating their own food or even shopping for it. Uh, well, that's just so pedestrian and old school. And, uh, you know, I want I want to just brought to my door. Thank you very much. So th this technology breeds a kind of dependency and codependency yes. and, you know, and interdependence, if you will. So today you know, a virtue, an ideal is not so much independence as it is dependence, codependence, Co and interdependence. And this is, to me, does not bode well for our futures as individuals, as human beings. You know, we have forgotten the noble virtues, virtues of uh, self-sufficiency or autarky, you know, actually, you know, being responsible enough to care for your life. Sure. Sure, I know. I'm, I, I'm, I have I have four chickens here, you know, just to have eggs and the neighbors are complaining just because they want to complain. I don't have the, the uh, how you say, the cock or the, the, the male chicken. I just have the female chickens because I just want the eggs and I yes. don't want to create noise around, you know. Although for the health of everyone, also the male should be around. But anyway, uh, I'm just saying, trying to grow my food, I have chicken and, and and this and I find it extremely difficult if you don't live in a community that has the same principles like you uh, regarding uh, autarkic farming you know or to to supply your own needs or at least half of them or some of them or 
most of them. It's really difficult to be on your own and do it. Really difficult. Um, and I struggle in doing so, but I see the, the advantage in my head, in the way I think, in the way I manage my life. I see the advantage of doing so because I'm not that dependent on others and on the big cartels and the shops and the media, etc., etc. Most people, just, just to give you an idea, and I tell the viewers also, where I live, right? I mean, there's a lot of uh, fruit trees in, uh, in um, around houses and in people's yards, you know, in the garden. Mm -hmm. But they don't pick the fruits. They go to the supermarket and buy fruits. And that's because they don't, something here is disconnected, you know, between what one should do and what he's actually doing because of outside force that convince him or wash his brain or telling him what he should do. And well, you know, in the States, for example, I, after all, I'm an American, I grew up here. Um, in uh, 1900, America was a largely an agrarian society still. Uh, think about it. If you're a small homesteader and you live on five acres, uh, and you had a garden, and you kept some chickens, and your neighbors were much like yourself. Yes. They may have larger land holdings. Some might keep cattle. Some might keep yes. sheep. You know, yeah. uh, other people are not far away, and they're fishermen. Yeah. They're seafarer people, or what have you. Yeah. Well, you didn't worry about where your next meal came from. Yes, I agree. And you had water on your own property. You had yes. a well. Yeah. At one time, you know, that's where this word well-being or wellness comes from. You know, it comes from the word well. And, uh, Excellent. you know, uh, a man was considered wealthy if he had a well, wow. if he had yes. access to a well. Yes. And so, uh, yes, um, if yeah. that person had water and that person had food and shelter from the storm. That's it. Every, everything else was luxury. Yes, yes. Everything else was a luxury, but we're disconnected today. You know, we're a cosmopolitan people, as some would say. You know, we expect other people to do that for us. It's not our responsibility. And of course, what's happened? You know, we've got this factory farm food, this horrible product in the grocery stores. You can't count on it. You know, you don't know if it's been poisoned. You don't know how it's been grown. We don't know the, the nutrient density of the carrots and the apples and the yeah. beets we eat. Yes. Uh, you, you know, we can't, we're depending on other people yeah. to tell us that it's good to eat and fit to eat and so forth and so on. You know, health healthcare in this country has turned into be a disaster. I mean, people get, uh, they stub their toe. They get a cut on their finger. They have a tummy ache. You know, their parents are, you know, frightened. They take the child to the emergency room. I mean, we used to take care of ourselves. Sure, sure, sure. I know. Here, it, this, you know, I could very easily go to a doctor, but I'm like, hang on, just a cut, you know. I put turmeric, put plaster, and within a couple of hours, it's it's closed, you know. It's already closed. It's just a little scar, and no need to make a mess out of <laughs> every little thing. I totally agree with you. And today, it's even even worse with, with the vaccines. You know, if someone gets hurt or cut, immediately he goes to take a vaccine and this. It's like... Get the tetanus shot. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, come on. I mean, I'm not to, not to play down the, the tetanus shot because if you cut yourself from, uh, I don't know, rusty metal, yes, it can be dangerous, as we know. Yes. Uh, but if you cut yourself from a glass... It's painful, but that's it. <laughs> you know, it's you will heal without a shot and without pills. It's all right. Our body is really, if you if you let it be, is immaculate. I mean, it's it can do everything. Well, my life for the past fifteen years has been an experiment in how can I live well, but also live poor. Because I have to tell you that, uh, you know, I dropped out of the system about 1997. And uh, I quit banking at the end of 2005. Wow, nice. I, I, I dreamt about it last night, man. I'm telling you I, how I leave my bank account, you know. How I, <laughs> I just stop having bank account, but go on, sorry. 
Well, we think about all of our dependencies and the yeah. contractual obligations, arrangements we've made in our lives. The truth is, is if we want to change anything, we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to do something about our contracts. It's, A it's, lot of people today simply do not, we were never taught yeah. in school growing up the nature of contracts yes. and how they really work in the real world. Did you see what you know, they sent you yesterday? The interview with yes. this woman? Yes. It's all about yes. that. Uh, just for whoever is listening, is about uh, a woman called Bibi Bakhus. And she's talking about there's no laws, they're just contracts. And we are not told these are just contracts that run our life. And we keep signing them. And there's a big difference, apparently, between a signature and an autograph. And she gave this example. And just for people to sort out maybe something in their head that this woman, Baby Bakho, she gave an example that if you go to a celeb, you don't ask his signature, you ask for his autograph, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because he's the, real, it's, he's the real human being that is giving you his name. But in all the contracts, you cannot use your, uh, uh, well, you're using your signature and the signature is for the fake or for the straw man that is being invented uh, as a person, not the living being created in the image of God, but as the person or the straw man that all the contracts are signed by him, not by the living man, by the straw man. And he is in a way the slave in all these contracts and owned and controlled by the system or by the royal families or by the corporations or by the courts etc but the real man is forever free and this is a trick that we need to sort our head around because i think a solution a proper solution can come out of it it can i can recommend a book for your listeners for yourself the web address is newpeopleorder.com. I know it. I've heard about it. Newpeopleorder.com. The name of the book is entitled, They Own It All, Including You, By Means of Toxic Currency. And it was written by Ron McDonald and Dr. Robert Rowan. Right. It's an inexpensive book. And it's worth very well worth reading. Can you just for the for the listeners and viewers, if you can like uh, books and websites that you mention uh, after the talk, I, I would like to put them on the description on the YouTube. Very good. That's my right. pleasure. If you can my help pleasure. me find find the links and send them to me, that's great. Go on. Sorry. Well, and then of course there's a freebie version that you can read of a book entitled the Anti Communitarian Manifesto. Ah, I saw this one. Yes. This was published in 2003. Yes. It was written by Nordica Friedrich and uh, her mother, Nikki Rapana. Um, right. Yeah, I'll supply a link for that. There's quite a bit of research there. Uh, they said they did something called the Anti-Communitarian League, mm -hmm. where they published their work. Can you? And of course. Sorry, can you? Um, let me put it this way. How? communitarianism is being implemented now in various countries i mean let's say all the countries under the un let's say or all the countries who already started to implement agenda 21 uh, how communitarianism that, would, that would be every country say again that would be every country including israel no but for example uh, iran Yes, they're them too. Also, uh, so every country is the Mozambique. Yes. I mean, yes, every country. Yes. Oh, that's really depressing. <laughs> we live thought... in a we live in a time of instant communication, shy. Yeah. Wow. So unless they're live unless they're living as uh, you know you in the, the the darkest part of Africa, yeah. they've been affected. If they know what a smartphone is. The, they've been they've been affected you know by the way that's my phone you know I'm, i don't have a smartphone i have this one and actually i divert all the calls to a 
just a landline, you know, with the speakerphone that I have. But By the way, that acronym SMART, it has many meanings. There are many people that use the English letters, yeah. S-M-A-R-T, yeah. to mean different acronyms. But looking at the cybernetic theory and uh, the work of Norbert Wiener at MIT, uh, I, I like to say that it is self-monitoring of analysis and reporting technology. Self-monitoring of analysis and reporting technology. Well, now when we talk about cybernetics, this requires biological input from you and me. Yeah. So every time we use a computer, a smart device, or a telephone, we are supplying biological input, okay, to uh, cyberspace, as it were. Yeah. And that's the reality of our world today. And that's why, why it's important to look at the work of, uh, you know, one of the isms that I've listed, uh, do a search on the internet, Lark on communitarianism. I list these various isms. Uh, one is utilitarianism. Well, the father of utilitarianism is Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy Bentham was quite uh, an interesting fellow. Um, you know, utilitarianism is the study of those things deemed utile or useful to the most number of people, mm -hmm. deemed beneficial or bring pleasure. Mm -hmm. Okay? So remember, the most studied creature on earth is man himself. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so um, he came up with something called the panopticon, which you can read about. It was a model prison. So we live in a virtual panopticon today. Look at the city of London and the number of CCTV sure. cameras, sure. you know, and uh, also, with 5G. Yeah, China I mean, now is going the big time as well as Israel. I mean, it's, it's all happening really quickly now. Right, right. Yeah. Well, see, uh, another group of people that are important in discussions of socioeconomics, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. Socioeconomics was a uh, portmanteau that was uh, supposedly coined by uh, Mikhail Gorbachev mm -hmm. and uh, Amitai Etzioni. Yes. Amitai Etzioni is uh, the uh, director of the Institute for Communitarian Policy Studies at George Washington University. He's 90 years old. Wow. His son, his son Oren Etzioni, O R E N, is at the University of Washington, mm -hmm. at the Paul Allen Institute. Paul Allen was an early partner, of course, Bill Gates at Microsoft, and he has been dubbed. Well, first of all, his father, uh, Amitai Etzioni, has been called the everything expert, <laughs> and now his son Oren Etz Etzioni has been called the world's foremost authority on artificial intelligence. Really? Yes. Wow. But could it be that maybe they're just getting depressed? <laughs> you see my point? Yes. But uh, uh, I forgot my train of thought, but uh, yeah. So, okay, I, I go back to the question I asked then, because it's to do with what you just said. Are you familiar with the Panopticon? I've heard about it. I read about it, but I forgot what it was. Maybe it's a digital dementia that I'm having. <laughs> but, uh... Well, here's, here's something very interesting uh, oh. for your listeners. If you type in your search engine, Panopticon, P-A-N-O-P-T-I-C-O-N, Panopticon, and then put in Cartome, C-A-R-T-O-M-E, Cartome. C A R T O M E. M E, right. Uh, another one is Cryptone. C R Y P T, Crypt O M E. All right. Because this is either or you're going to learn about Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon. You're going to get an overview and then you're going to get the actual publication that you can read for yourself on the internet. And then you're also going to see something called reversing the Panopticon. Mm hmm. And you can learn about the story of the Minotaur and the Labyrinth and how, in other words, we got ourselves into this situation, okay? Well, how do we reverse our way out? Yeah. 
reverse engineer, if you will. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And so that would be an interesting word to realize, okay? Because at the end of the day, I think as time goes on, people are going to say, you know something? Uh, I feel trapped. This is not quite the life I sure. wanted for myself. Sure. And I, I can do better. I've matured, you know? I learned more, I've learned more about myself and the yeah. world, okay? And that's why having these discussions today is important because we have to leave a legacy for our progeny. Absolutely. Um, we have to we have to let them know that yes, daddy, mommy, they were on to the con. They saw it. They didn't want this life for you. They did not want you to be a slave. Okay? They didn't want you to be a peon. Remember that's from a feudal system. Hmm. Peonage. And remember when it comes to the USA, you know, it was said that we declared our independence and we were made uh, independent from the crown. Well, I beg to differ sure. because the, the fact is, is what we were afforded was what's called suzerainty. And suzerainty is S-U-Z-E-R-A-I-N-T-Y. And this is a status under the feudal law. In other words, a suzerain is a protectorate. Hmm. Okay, and the other thing too is that the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Revolutionary War, mm -hmm. uh, there was three representatives or esquires for the American colonist side, and that would have been Benjamin Franklin, John Jay, and John Adams. And for the Crown side, it was David Hartley. Now these members, these were all members of the bar. Hmm. The British bar. Yeah, yeah, sure. Who was their loyalty to? Royal family. <laughs> the British bar. The, yeah, obviously. Yeah, the British accredited registry. Yeah. Or the crown. That's where it's headquartered. Sure, sure. But uh, be that as it may, uh, if you read the Treaty of Paris, you'll find out that we, you know, the international law did exist. You know, we've heard of Vattel's Law of Nations. Okay, well, under the law of nations, the American representatives never requested that the territory of the colonies, those 13 colonies, be uh, granted to the colonists. Because at the time, they were quite well aware of the law of nations. Under the right of conquest and the law of discovery, which was part of international national request was never made nor concessions granted the crown to relinquish <clears throat> their actual territorial rights or their claim upon the land itself and this has been the poison pill that the so-called founding fathers had to swallow i'm losing my voice yeah i i already know and i would i would guess that at least most of my listeners or viewers, they also know that the United States was never free. I mean, it was always part of the crown. You know, those who are aware of that are aware of that. The majority isn't. The thing is, or the question is, whether it's an American uh, man or woman, whether it's an Israeli one, whether it's a British one, how if you have any idea, <laughs> how can we come out of this trap, of this prison, of this panopticon prison, or digital prison, or monetary prison, that we are, you know, with each day that's passing, it's, it seems like it's more difficult to get out of it. And it's being done in such a way. So my question is, do you have any idea how can we overcome it or come out of this trap? I do. I'm not qualified to tell anybody how to get out of the trap. I can only explain sure. from an intellectual vantage point mm -hmm. that I have actually created a blueprint. Because at the end of the day, what we need to digest is a few a word as possible to guide our lives, 
to be our guiding lights. In other words, we need to have a place to come to center. And if we're going to use language, if we're going to employ language, we need to have as few words as possible so that they can be anchors for what lights our way, what guides our ship, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I call them the nine words. And anybody can make this up themselves. And you can teach an eight-year-old child about these things, okay? Mm -hmm. It's just nine words. If you know these nine words, you ask yourself, do they have relevance? Do they have meaning? Okay? How can they relate to you and how you live your life? How will they impact upon my destiny? Why are these things important? Mm -hmm. And so I've come up with nine words. That's an intellectual blueprint. And, uh, uh, you know, I can, I can provide those nine words for you with links, you know, that you can put in the description box. Please do, yes. You know, nowadays, though, we have to look at what begins the listing of those nine words, and that would be what I call the three C words. And that would be compliant, complacent, and complicit. If you are one, you're probably all three. But these three words will tell you, are you part of the problem or are you mm -hmm. part of the solution? Yeah. Okay. And I like to say that uh, there was a professor, there is a professor named uh, Dr. Martin Seligman, and he's come up with something called the learned helplessness theory. Okay. And to that, I ascribe the so-called three A's. And that would be uh, uh, amnesia. That's loss of memory. Abulia, that's loss of will. A B U L I A, or it's also spelled A B O U L I A, loss of will. And the last one is apathy, mm. loss of care or concern. Yes. This is what's being bred into us yeah. by design. Yeah. This is how we're being socially engineered. In other words, you throw your hands up and you say, well, what can I do about it? That's, that's, you know, it's not my problem. Sure. You know, this, that, you know, so what? No, also, dialectic? It doesn't matter. It's to not me. just, it's not just that's not my problem because even people who see that this is their problem and also it affect, it affects their life. What can I do about it? They don't know. They, they, they give up even before starting to think what they can do about it. They don't really think. They just say this question, but they don't... The nine words will begin the process to actually begin to think for yourself again. That's why I say a child can be taught these things. What, what are the nine words? I mean, anyway, I will write them down. You will send, it, send them to me, but if you can just go through them. Well, then there is something called counter-economics. All right. There is autarky. Right. But it's spelled two ways. It's actually two words. A-U-T-A-R-C-H-Y and A-U-T-A-R-K-Y. Autarky with C-H or autarchism, it's self-governance. All right. In other words, you are capable of managing your own, your own affairs. Yeah. And okay. We, and with a K? It, it, no, and that also implies self-ownership. In right. other words, uh, you own your body, yeah. you own your mind. If there's nothing else you can say in this life that you do own, yes, it's but your mind and your body. Yes, correct. Okay, the space yeah. between your ears. Is yeah. it yours? Is it, do you really own that? You see? <laughs> yes. And then autarky is self-sufficiency. Uh, Sufficiency, yeah, exactly. All right. All right. right. So I didn't know there's a difference like with the CH, it's the two meanings that you said before, right? Like yes. you, you own your mind and your body. And uh, um, what was the first one? It's, it's self reliance. Self reliance. Self ownership. And ownership, yeah, that's better. And uh, autarky with a K is self sufficiency. Sufficiency, all right. In other words, are you capable of taking care of yourself? Of your needs. Yes. You say, yes. All right. Yeah. So this, you consider them as two different words or, or one word? They are. They're entirely different two words. Different, they just pronounce exactly. the same. Exactly. All right. So now we have six words of the nine. Why? No, I counted four, I think. There's, no, there's compliant, 
Ah, so you count these implicit. as well. All right. Yes, yes, yes. So, so it's one, two, three. Then there's counter economics. Yes. That's a hyphenated word. Look it up. All right. Okay. This is all. This is akin to trade and barter. Okay. No. <laughs> it's all human activities which are forbidden by the state. Counter economics. I invite you and your listeners to just simply look it up. A couple of libertarian theorem uh, theoreticians dreamt this up. Uh, Samuel Edward Conklin the mm third, -hmm. and then uh, J. Neil Shulman. Mm -hmm. Okay, he was a filmmaker and author. Both of them were. Uh, I think Mr. Shulman's still alive. They're both Jewish, by the way. Mm -hmm. Quite interesting. And then let's go to the last three words. Okay, well, these three words I made up, in a sense. Right. But that's okay. You can make up your own words. Yeah, yeah, sure. And the by first the way, one... By the way, I, I uh, invented a word. This was like 15 years ago, maybe more. Percussionism. I like it. Yeah, because I play drums and I play all sorts of drums and percussion. So I came up with a profession, <laughs> you know, or, or a word or a noun to say what is it that I do or what field I'm in, which is percussionism. But anyway, I just remembered it. Go on. Your three well, words. My, my friends and correspondents will smile because they know I like all words that end in ISM. <laughs> exactly. So percussionism. And by the way, for fun, there's a, there's a resource on the Internet. It's simply called The Ism Book. Nice. ISM book. And uh, just do a search and you'll I'm find sure it. I'm sure you read it. <laughs> okay, the last three words yes. in my nine word, and remember, this is a blueprint. This is my personal blueprint that I offer up as a model so that you can create your own blueprint. Yes. Okay? Um, because this, with these nine words, these, these can guide everything I do and know about life. Right. Okay, for me. Uh, those words are well-beingness well-beingness or well-beingness well-beingness all right well-being w e w e l l and then hyphen b e i n g yeah and, and ness n e s s yes well that's the condition of well-being sure that's that's our like happiness okay? natural state of that we should live in Right. And uh, then uh, you have, um, um, I'm trying to remember, <laughs> um, there's law, the word law. Well, I have uh, distilled all law, doesn't matter what kind of law, natural law, universal law, Common spiritual law. law. Yeah. You name the law, constitutional law, yeah. international law, yeah. law of the land, law of the yeah. sea, maritime, yeah. I don't yeah. care. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can fill up a book just in the types of law, yeah. environmental law today. Yeah. Okay. One word, and that word is counteract. Because the letters contained within that one word, counteract, form other words. For example, count, con tract mm. contact mm. so all um, anything that you encounter in life can be thought of as either a contact or a contract mm. contact or contract all right mm. no matter what you engage whatever you encounter it's going to involve those words contact and contract. Okay. And there's some follow up that I can point you to that, you know, to help you uh, discover why this is true. Okay. Mm. And I'm trying to remember the last word. I can't think of it. Oh, economy. E All right. Economy. Economy, I spell econo hyphen me. Right. Now that me, would be. So that me, would, it's M E M E. Yes. Economy. Yeah, that would be your personal economy. Yes, clever. <laughs> so when you say economy, that's pointing your, pointing back at you. Yes, well, yes. Okay, forget about what all the eggheads say economy is. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
you know, you can read an article by Ryan Grimm on the internet, you know, how the Federal Reserve bought the economics profession. Yeah. Well, that's how they bought all the oh, professions. Yeah, it's true. You see? And uh, you can read that article too. But uh, when we talk about economy and what it really means, you know, it comes from the Greek. Yeah. And then it was Latinized. Yeah. But uh, it's the personal and ergonomic, efficient management of one's own household. Sure. And so what is your household? Well, it begins with that which resides inside your own skin. Mm. That's your household. The temple of your soul, yeah. if you will. Yeah. You see? So that's why these nine words are important. And then I explain how you can, do, you can separate between wants and needs. Needs always supersede wants. Mm -hmm. Wants are born of desire. Yeah. Needs are born of necessity. Necessity, yes, yeah, sure. So sure. it's needs first and wants second. Sure. And when we speak about economy, you know, there's always um, 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 a discussion about resources. Yeah. Or sources. Yeah. You know, well, how will you, you know, you know, how will you uh, supply yourself with these needful, necessary resources? Okay. And so if a person really wants to be self-sufficient and be responsible to themselves, the first thing that they have to discover for themselves is how are they going to nourish their mind and their body mm. and do it in the most efficient ergonomic fashion possible. Maybe you don't want to be a dirt farmer. You don't have to. I myself am discovering, uh, rediscovering sprouting. Yeah. Sprouting is living foods, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm interested in something called pemmican. Pemmican is an American Indian word. For what? At one time, you can look it up. Pemmican is spelled P as in Paul, E-M-M -M as in Mary, mm -hmm. I-C-A-N, pemmican. Pemmican, all right. Pemmican is a mixture of, of uh, fat and desiccated, dried game meat. And it was the currency of the, of the frontier in the Old West, in the settlement of America. <coughs> there was even something that you or your listeners can look up. It's called the Pemmican Wars. What was the most important currency? What was the most important article of trade? It wasn't gold and silver. It was pemmican. It was food. Food that could travel well, that could last a long time. And so this is pemmican. So it's sort of preserved food. I mean, it's highly it's, it's, nutritioned it's, preserved food, right? It's the most, most nutrient-dense dense, food on yes, Earth. Yes, yes. All right. But it, it so, was always to do with meat. If it's it has to do with meat. Meat with meat, yes, yes. Right. And of course, you know, when you think about how primitive peoples eat, you know, they were hundred No, no, sure. I, I don't have... before, there were, before there was agriculture. Yeah, you know, sure. agriculture is what spawns civilization. Sure, sure. You see? Sure. And a lot of people will say, anthropologists and the like, will say that, you know, man took a long turn with agriculture mm. and civilization. Yes. You see, I've heard that. Uh, but, but anyway, the, the, this blueprint is something that you could teach your child, okay? And you say, and you can ask, and he can ask questions, you know, and you can answer the questions for him to, to help him, you know, like why is this exercise important? Because see, the expert at the end of the day is you yourself, yeah. including that eight-year-old child. Yeah. Who's the final authority? Yeah. Well, it's you. Me? Yes. It's absolutely. your life. Yeah. It's your life. You have to take ownership, take responsibility. And by the way, communitarians do not believe that anybody has rights which are unaccompanied by duties and responsibilities. Hmm. So it's not all doom and gloom what these people think. But what's important is that we are aware of how they think, yes. how these thoughts are influencing policy, statutes, codes, regulations, and the like, wherever you happen to live. And what, what, what would you say, what would you say, Lark, to those who may hear about Agenda 21, about uh, sustainability, about depopulation, about communitarianism, and so on and so forth, and just say, ah, this is just conspiracy theory. What, 
I mean, I ask this some other guests as well, but I want to ask you because of your specific angle <laughs> on on things, on life, on how to understand them through language. Um, what would you say to those people? Well, I would say that I'd be delighted if these things never entered your mind. Hmm. Okay, and they never they did not impact upon you negatively. In a, in a bad way. Mm. I would be delighted yeah. because I actually love people who are very simple. Yeah. You know, I like to say that a man who knows how to shoe a horse in Texas, yeah. and he's very good at shoeing a horse, yeah. and people for miles around know he is an expert, and he's very good with animals. Yeah. I mean, I admire that man. Yeah. I admire that man, yeah. you see? And, uh, uh, however, I think, you know, we are people that live in the city. We live in the modern world. We're connected to the internet. You know, we are bombarded with information. We're never at a loss. Mm. Uh, you know, we're going to be fed constantly as long as we provide that biological input, which is turning on the computer mm -hmm. and, and going into that world of cyberspace. We have to realize that the world is different. It's changed today. It's different. Yeah. It is a minefield. Yeah. It's, um, it's a lot more of a sophisticated world. And there are people who spend their entire days and lives working on ways to manipulate you. But they don't think they're doing anything wrong. Yeah. They think they're do that they're doing a good thing. Yeah. You see, uh, people who are systems analysts for... Uh, uh, a Fortune 500 company in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, they mm -hmm. think these they're doing good work. Mm -hmm. You know, a man who works uh, at the for uh, the CIA or Mossad, these people think they're doing necessary and good work. Yes, but that's, bankers, yes, the that, same. Yes, and we have to be cognizant of this these terms of art like unwitting dupes and useful idiots. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't know if it was Lenin or Stalin who said we need all the unwitting dupes and useful idiots that we can get. You know, how many people uh, in these uh, these horrible wars of the 20th century uh, thought they were doing good, good. the right thing? Sure. You can know, you can many? you can you throw also uh, uh, like a quick thought about the role of 5G in quickening this process of communitarianism? Well, I think this is, this is um, concomitant with that title, that Adam Curtis documentary, Hypernormalization. Hmm. You know, they're putting the finishing touches. It's a mopping up operation now. You know, they, they feel like they've got this thing in the bag. They own the politicians. I mean, in the States, for example, I know the political situation in Israel is quite unique. And uh, especially from, now, from, after my, two, from my vantage point, after two elections, and probably will go to a third election within the same year, which is unheard yeah. of. And it's it's a waste. But go on, go on. Well, I mean, like, I don't vote. I don't want to participate. You know, I. I, uh, first of all, communitarian thinking has control of both parties. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in fact, the lesser parties that draw a few votes, like the Constitution Party, the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, they're dominated by people in this communitarian thinking, whether they know it or not. Now, people can be communitarians and not even know what this word is or yeah. what it means. Yeah, sure. Okay. And if you if you go online and you do a search, communitarianism, first things first. I have the story of the use. The Y O O little letter S use. The biggest problem of the world is the use. What's use? Y O O S. Well, you'll have to read it to get to capture the flavor. But there is a U, which is an E W E U. Now this is a this is a female sheep who is customarily sheared and milked before finally being led to slaughter. That's one kind of a U. <laughs> All right. Then there's the capital Y O U U. Yeah. 
which yeah. our friend BB spoke to in the 20-minute yeah. yeah. interview yeah, that yeah. you graciously turned me on to. Yeah. That's the corporate you. Yeah. That's the straw man you. Okay, the good, vaunted corporate citizen. Yeah. Well, and this may be surprising, then there is the J-E-W-U, pronounced like you, like a Mexican pronounces the word yob, All right. as in yob. And that's what? A U, spelled J-E-W, but pronounced Y-E-W-U, yeah. is of a people apart. Some say a separate species altogether. Mm -hmm. So you have E-W-E-U, and then you have J-E-W-U, mm -hmm. and you have capital Y-O-U-U, -U, mm -hmm. and collectively these are all U spelled Y-O-O-S, U's. All U's are communitarians. Why? Why all use are communitarianists? Because that's the definition of what is a communitarian. A communitarian is part of the system. A communitarian mm. is compliant, complacent, complicit. Mm. They feed the system. Mm. They're part of it. They're not separate from the world altogether. They love high tech. They love a lot of things about the modern world. And see, because there's another definition, do a search, communitarianism, first things first, mm -hmm. written by me, and you'll see other people and how they've weighed in to what is a communitarian and what is communitarianism, what is communitarian law. I tried to condense my 15 years of research into two very short pieces. Communitarianism, first things first, and the other one is LARP on communitarianism. Yeah. What I am, have yet to complete, because it's probably the most difficult one yet, is entitled Techno Slavery. Which, if you don't mind, I go back to the question of communitarianism and 5G. Please. And you already started, I feel like, <laughs> you started to answer it, but. I, I'll ask you for they me. want to accelerate it. They want to accelerate the process. Okay. They want to speed the connectivity, the communications. Okay. And the bioethicists have come together and decided that it's more important to save the planet, to bring the world together in unison so that we can communicate instantaneously than to be concerned about trivialities like the fact that it's harmful to human health. Right. And see, the bioethicists pay, play a, a very important role today. These are the so-called social scientists, okay? These are people that uh, uh, we used to call pseudoscientists, okay? Yes, it's true. <laughs> and that's because this word socioeconomics is so important. Yeah. They've brought together elements of the social scientists, sociology and the yeah. like, yes. the economic sciences. This is not anything but a pseudoscience. Yes, yes. Okay. And then, of course, uh, socio and economics. Okay. Because see, everybody has a, a value placed on them. Because the first thing that these uh, communitarians want to do with their so-called COPS program, which is communitarian law enforcement, that's community-oriented policing services. Okay. Began right. around early 1990 in, in the States. 91, 92, right about the time uh, Etzioni founded the, uh, the uh, Institute of Communitarian for Communitarian Policy Studies, uh, is a data gathering operation. Then you had programs like ABCD, another communitarian law enforcement program. It's the same in Israel, in Iraq, China, Russia, today. Different names, perhaps. We speak English today. Mm -hmm. two of us, mm -hmm. but uh, that would be ABCD, that's Asset-Based Community Development. It sounds very nice and lovely until you discover what it is. <laughs> Normally, a, that's the story. I mean, Agenda 21, when you read it, it sounds great. I mean, they want but to But they're all communitarian. Them. They're all communitarian. Yes, you yes. See. Sure. 
communitarian law enforcement went into high gear after 9-11 and the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. They brought all law enforcement agencies under the rubric or the aegis of Department of Homeland Security. We now have fusion centers. Another program is COMPASS, Community Oriented Mapping, Planning and Analysis for Safety Strategies. Sounds lovely. Not so much, but yes, I see what you mean. (laughs) When President Clinton assumed office, I think, was it 90? What year was that? I don't remember. 95. 92. 92 92 or something like that. Well, remember what happened in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. You know, that was the so-called Earth Summit. Yes. And Severin Suzuki gave her speech, the 12-year-old Canadian girl, the daughter of David Suzuki. And now we have another girl doing the same. I mean, you know. It's, it's psychological warfare. Yeah. And these people are actors. You know, they're assigned for their roles, you know, and they're trained and so forth. Just like an actor is trained and learns a part. If we, if we don't... He came, up, he came up with something called reinventing government. It was a policy initiative begun during the Clinton administration. Well, what was that policy? They were going to reinvent government. Well, how were they going to do that? They privatized government, Mm. which is to say there are no longer in America any public offices, nor are there any public lands. Now, if you're Mr. Rothschild or you're a a billionaire banker or an industrialist, you kind of like the way the works and the way it's run now because you've done very well in this system. This is the language you speak and the language you understand. Sure. You know, you have you have assets and you have liabilities and so forth. Well, in a communitarian system, everybody is going to be adjudged according to their value. And you've heard of the social credit score in China. Yeah. You know, just to participate in the system today is very important. What is your credit score? you know, and so forth and so on. But we're going to see melding and melding together of all these different systems. It's only going to get worse and worse because of 5G. That's, I was just about to ask you, are you an optimistic or pessimistic? And you were just saying it's going to get worse and worse. And I'm like, all right, you just sort of... Well, I know in my own life, I'm 65. I'm probably not going to live forever. I know that based on what I've spent 15 years of my life doing, I know that I have to make changes. Yeah. And so at least now I have an awareness that I didn't have before. Exactly. I mean, I have an awareness today that I didn't have when I was 25 or 45 or even 55. So here is is an important question because most people, they think that ignorance is bliss (laughs) in a way. But you, knowing what you know today, compared to 30 years ago, all right? Although what you know today can make you depressed, theoretically even, all right? Would you rather not knowing what you know today? Or would you rather know or be be aware with the price, the personal price you pay uh, and uh, the circumstances of life, you know, we live in today? Would you rather know what you know or not? Uh, Well, I have to tell you, I've always been a cynic. Okay, in my life, I questioned everything. I was a class clown. I got straight A's until I decided this game's not fun. I want to do something else. Mm -hmm. I played that game. Okay, mom and dad, Mm -hmm. I did that. It's boring. Okay, I want to do something else. I'm really not that smart. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Mm -hmm. I know this about myself. Mm -hmm. I'm lazy. I have faults Mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. But, you know, what started it for me was I was so angry because I knew even as a young teenager that attorneys were involved in a criminal protection racket. And I knew that doctors were involved in a criminal protection racket because I liked to read this even then. Okay. Well, my entire nuclear family, starting with my mother in 1996, my father in 2003, my little sister four months later, and my younger brother in 2011 were all murdered by their doctors. So there was a part of me that 
I've warned, I warned my family members about these people when I was young, yeah. when I was a voracious reader. Yeah. I wanted to learn what in the hell is going on in this world. Yeah. I'm not getting all the answers from my parents. Yeah. They wanted to force compliance, you know. Dad wanted me to be a dentist or a yeah. doctor. Mom wanted me to be an attorney, you know. Well, I wanted to write poetry, you know. <laughs> you know, poets, nobody paid poets, you know. It was hard sure. to make a buck, you know. Sure. <laughs> but uh, I became a serial entrepreneur in my life. I say I was a cook until I was 40 years old, but most of the time I was self-employed. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, uh, I'm glad I know about what I know today because with the time I have left in this life, I want to share what I know because I'm like that little kid in elementary school. We had what was called show and tell. We had, we had the uh, Dick and Jane primers, you know, Zeke Boniface was my hero. He was the garbage man, you know, <laughs> everybody loved Zeke. <laughs> and of course his face was bony, Zeke Boniface. Okay. But, uh, I'm like that little kid, you know, I've learned something and I want to share it and I want to share it in a way that it connects to you or with you and it makes, and it, and you think it's important because I don't want to, you know, be uh, a chicken little and, and tell you that there's, you know, I have exciting information to share. The sky is falling, you, you know, or the emperor is not wearing any clothes. Yeah. You know, I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that actually makes a, a human connection with you in such a way that you're curious enough about this topic, look at my research, look at other people's research that have already paved the way, and realize that you have to define this word and make the determination whether or not it resonates, means anything at all to you, yes or no, or not. And I can tell you from my experience, this is the one word that intelligent people should know about, mm. but that they don't know about as evidenced by the fact they do not talk about talk it. Talk about it, yes, sure. sure. Luck in Texas. Well, a couple of things. One is uh, I think you um, on video is much better than just audio because, and I've listened to uh, some audio you, you made, right? And Seeing your face and your eyes and your mimics, I think, well, I not think, I know, it's better than not seeing your eyes and face and mimics, all right? Just so you know, it okay. helps, it helps, because to see who you are and where you saying what you're saying from, it's very important, very important for us, for, for us, the people, the, 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 the human beings that need this knowledge, this data, this encouragement to go and learn and do our own research. So thank you for that, for appearing on video. It's very important. Well, thank you for, uh, uh, <laughs> I have to tell you, uh, I've, this is a split screen I'm looking at. And as you're speaking, or as, if I'm speaking, I'm looking at you. Yes. And when I look at myself, I'm shocked. That's not me. <laughs> All right. You understand? Um, because I, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't look in the mirrors very often anyway. Yeah. 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 Anymore. Uh, yeah. I knew some time ago that the prettiest girls in the, in the supermarket looked right through me. <laughs> so I knew I must be getting older and uglier. So. Right. <laughs> No, but really the, the, you know, the spark in their, in their eyes, in your eyes, in everyone's eyes, although it's on video, I mean, you in Texas, I'm in Israel, I mean, still something is going through this technology, and this is a great advantage of this technology, that it can help us bring forth this information with the people or with the with the man who is speaking this information, this knowledge. And it's, I think it's very important. And I also lis just listen to stuff, you know, mostly at night, I just listen to audio. Even though there's a video, I, I, I won't watch it, but I just listen to it. 
Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to say thank you for that, for appearing on video. And I think also the viewers and listeners who know you from other uh, podcasts and interviews, I think they will appreciate it too. The second thing I wanted to tell you is thank you for what you bring because it's highly important. Very few, if any at all, almost none, are speaking about this communitarianism subject and subjects which are related to it. I mean, even if someone speaks about Agenda 21, it normally no, no one is mentioning communitarianism. And given it's going so, uh, so long, I mean, it's way back from the 18th, from the 19th, 19th century, right? Yes. Yes. And I never knew about this world until, uh, I don't know, a month ago, let's say, roughly. And even now I don't feel like, feel like I know enough, you know, after spending one and a half hour with you or how long we, we've been on air. And it's like, listen, it's I understand now how important it is to know about it and I will try and push this video as much as I can. And I would like also to fix, uh, not at the moment, but to fix another interview with you um, but this we will speak in private. I just wanted to thank you for these 15 years of research that you actually putting uh, um, in the front now and you're saying, listen, read this book, watch this video, uh, try and understand these words. It's so important because most people, doesn't matter if they speak English or Hebrew or French, most people are dumbed down by the same system, by the same principles, by the same ideology. And we need to come out of it. We need to wake up, literally wake up to our nature, to our gifts. You know, we were given so many gifts. And the main one is this brain that can overcome so many obstacles. And it is, this brain, it is the biggest gift we were given. And no other animal was given this sort of capabilities. And we need to use it not just to... You know, you know, observe you know, the screen. You know, Shai, this life is one of abundance. We have been told it's one of scarcity. Yeah. yeah. This is not true. Yeah. This life is one of abundance. I agree. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lark. Uh, I will uh, I, I'll upload this video, but please send me all the links you think are important for the viewers and uh, listeners to to go and do their own research. And uh, my pleasure. Hi, this easy, very easily done. Excellent. Uh, send send via email. All right. Send me via email everything. I will. Because I will. then it's just easy to copy and paste. You know. So and do you have a quiet home today? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, not Eight for long. Not Monday. for long, but yes. Oh. Not for long, yeah. Not for long. Um, yeah, thank you for everything, and I, I, we'll catch up very soon, all right? Well, I'll be delighted. We'll talk again. Anytime, by the way. Excellent. Do, do you want to say some like, last thing to the viewers and listeners? If you oh, have a... well, no. I think uh, it's important that they read a little bit first, yes. uh, and then maybe develop some questions, because asking these questions is important. Yes. Because, see, this, this, none of these words matter unless you have questions and are curious but basically it it's really about life and when you think about it the difficulties that you or anyone that you know are having they they, they must be addressed because this is the nature of our of our mm. being you know we want to we want to think of ourselves as self-correcting you know we know that we're gonna that we're error prone and we are but we want the best for ourselves and we want the best for our other people. I think people are really naturally this way. Especially also for and our uh, offspring. I mean, they, they are the future and we need to, well, we have an obligation to learn these things for them. I mean, never mind us. I mean, them. The, anyway, I mean, we can start a whole new conversation now. <laughs> I'd like to say that I think it's important that we learn to love ourselves yeah. because how is it that we can be expert or qualified to love others 
if we haven't practiced on ourselves yeah. first. Excellent. Does it mean that we feed our ego and allow ourselves no, to be no, no. egomaniacs? That, that's sure. not what that means sure, at all. Sure. But, so I think it's, uh, I mean, I think there are such things as noble virtues that we can agree on are virtuous and noble, you know, because I think we are a special creature. Yes. You know, I think that uh, we can be much better than we are. We can always improve. But I think it's important that we love ourselves first. Then we can, then we, then we have some, we have some real knowledge of what it means to love because now we can love other people. Excellent. On this note, we can finish because it's a very optimistic and very, there's something pure in it. Um, love thyself. Uh, thank you very much, Lark. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. I'm looking forward for our next conversation. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm delighted that you, uh, you asked me to join you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.